All right, I'm going to kick it off. Good evening. It's 7 p.m. I'd like to open the March 11th, 2021 school committee meeting. This meeting is being held virtually through Zoom. The town of Littleton began conducting remote participation Zoom meetings pursuant to Governor Baker's emergency order suspending certain provisions of the open meeting law on March 19th, 2020. Since that time, unanticipated legal concerns relating to the open meeting law have been brought to our attention by the town clerk. Those concerns were supported by the Attorney General's office and confirmed by town council. One concern is that the chat function allows a parallel text conversation to a board's public meeting. Chat is essentially running commentary that is occurring but is not moderated or followed by the chair. All participants and listeners may not be aware of comments being made because some meeting participants join by phone and do not see these conversations. Another concern is conversations between residents within the chat room which are not incorporated into the public record. In response to these concerns, the town will implement the following changes, which in no way prohibit any member of the public from participating in discussion and sharing information during a public meeting, and will ensure that all listeners and participants have equal access to this meeting. People that join the Zoom meeting are set so their microphones are muted. If you called in by phone, please use star six to mute or unmute your phone. So that the meeting can occur in an orderly fashion, we ask the people who join keep their microphones on mute so background noises do not interfere with the meeting. If you wish to participate in the meeting, please use the raise your hand function available on Zoom, or if you called in by phone, dial star nine, which will activate the raise your hand function. The meeting host will notify the chair of the raised hands and the chair will determine whether and when to allow public comment. When called upon, participants should unmute and state their name and address. After speaking, we request that the participant return their microphone back to mute. All right, now we got that out of the way, we can get into the meeting. We'll start with the consent agenda, the minutes from February 25th, 2021, and oath to bills and payroll. Make a motion to approve the minutes from February 25th, 2021, and oath to bills and payroll. Second. All right, motion made a second. Is there any discussion on the consent agenda? All right, seeing none, I'll take a, all our votes or roll call votes on Zoom. I'll start with Timelin. Timelin Rassius, yes. Matt. Matt Hunt, yes. Justin. Justin McCarthy, yes. Brad. Brad Austin, yes. And Mike Fontanella votes yes as well. All right. Next, we have the first of at least two opportunities for input from interested citizens. Uh, there'll be one at the end of the meeting, and there may very well be uh, some opportunities during particular agenda items, especially tonight. Uh, but if there's anybody who would like to speak before the school committee now at the beginning of the meeting, please use the raise your hand function. And Dorothy will get you in front of us. We do not have any raised hands, Chairman Fontanella, at this time. All right. And we will keep going right along. We're going to start with uh, some recognition. Dr. Clencher, do we have anything under recognition tonight? Uh, thank you, Chairman Fontanella. Uh, actually, I don't want to spend a lot of time on this. I'm really excited that we have students here this evening to uh, talk about uh, the think tank and the imaginatorium. But... Uh, just a couple. Uh, I'm really pleased that the uh, governor and our commissioner of education uh, rallied for her teachers and staff and were able to uh, dedicate some days for, for teacher vaccinations. Uh, it's very helpful as we, we move forward. Uh, today was a good day for, for our staffs being able to book appointments. Uh, we had a large number of appointments booked today and and some of our teachers have, were uh, able to get vaccinated this week uh, through CVS because they opened up the portal to uh, educators and staff early on. So I'm feeling really good about this and, and uh, keeping our fingers crossed that uh, all of our staff will be uh, vaccinated within the next two or three weeks. So I'm gonna be optimistic and uh, they're opening up more vaccination sites as well. So uh, I think we're in a lot better shape than we were three days ago. Uh, Cheryl Temple uh, also uh, has uh, recognition that uh, she would like to talk about this evening, so I'm going to turn it over to her. Thank you, Dr. Clenchy. Um, I'd like to take a minute to recognize um, uh, Russell Street School students and staff would like to thank Mark Nystrom and Harvard University for their donation of three 80-inch televisions. Um, Mark reached out to us a few weeks ago um, about this donation when Harvard University was renovating several of their classrooms. They were actually purchasing larger than 80 inch televisions. Um, and so Mark was gracious enough to um, make three separate trips to the Russell Street School to deliver these um, televisions to us. 
We're currently in the process of mounting two of the 80 inch televisions on walls in the building and one will be on a cart um, so we could utilize it um, upstairs in the building um, and students will benefit them. So again, uh, special thanks to Mark Nystrom um, for his consideration and generous donation from Harvard University. Awesome, thank you. All right, that it for recognition, Dr. Clenchy? Uh, that's it, thanks. All right, now we're gonna get into the presentations. Our first one is the elementary level think tank and Imagitorium and Heidi McGregor, who we've missed and we're always happy to have her with us. She brings the best presentations and gets, she has more fun than anyone in the district, I'm guessing. So yeah, we're gonna kick it off to Heidi and let her show us what kind of fun she's been having lately. Thank you, Chairman. <laughs> I definitely have the best job in the world. I'm not complaining. <laughs> Um, so I brought um, two co-presenters with me this evening. Um, so if we could show the slides. Um, here we go. Thank you. All right. So I brought two fifth graders from Miss Cotter's fifth grade class. Um, I have Samiksha Pasanuru. Hello. <laughs> Hello. Hi. I see you. And Ambi Harriman. That's me. Hi. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Next slide, please. Um, and they are my resident experts on what it's like to um, experience maker spaces during a um, during a pandemic. Oh, go back one more slide. There we go. Um, so I'll start by just talking about Shaker Lane just for a quick minute. <clears throat> um, at Shaker Lane, um, Shakey's Imagitorium um, has um, not been in person this year. So what I've done instead is all of our K-2 students are getting STEAM bags. Um, and these bags are have um, materials in them so that students can practice novel engineering, which is a way to interact with literature while um, building, actually they actually build physical objects that they could theoretically give to characters to solve problems in the story. Um, and then, then the students have to explain what they made and how it would help that character. Um, so it's really great to be able to integrate into literacy this year at, um, with Shaker Lane. On the next slide, please. At Russell Street, we took a slightly different um, uh, approach um, to bringing STEM and STEAM into the classrooms. Um, so based on a um, feedback from a parent survey um, last spring, um, we decided to have ongoing STEM projects that students could use as an on-demand type of experience. Um, so what um, we did was we created three modules that last about nine weeks each, about a trimester long, and each grade level <clears throat> um, can access those modules um, at their own pace um, and when they have time to do it. And each module has three components. So there's a skill building component, um, an opportunity to apply that skill to their curriculum, um, and then an opportunity to um, actually use a passion project approach to using that um, technique. Um, so the first module we're gonna talk about is our stop motion animation using Google Slides. And I brought Ambi, who is an expert on this, um, and that's on the next slide. Um, and he'll talk a little bit about his experience with um, this particular module. Now, my experience with this module is, uh, is very fun. I, I created an animation about a gingerbread man for my skill building phase. And then uh, I had so much fun with that, I made it my passion project. Now, for our applying of the skill, we we did the uh, we so us fifth graders we are doing an inventors inventions project where we learn about a specific inventor or specific invention. We created an animation that tells other people about that inventor slash invention, and to create a stop motion animation, you pre uh, Google Slides. You put in a character or a anything really, and you duplicate that slide, that one slide, and you then move that character or whatever it is, uh, just the smallest bit. You modify it the smallest bit. You duplicate that second slide. You modify it the smallest bit again. 
you duplicate it again and again and again, modifying it again and again and again, and when you finally play it, when it's finished, um, it will seem as if the a character or thing is moving or being modified as a smooth circle. Now, for me, that can take a lot of slides. For my first gingerbread man animation, it took 270 slides <laughs> just to get it to the perfect cliffhanger. And it was so much fun creating it. Uh, and so that's... It, it was really fun just to do the animation. Thank you. <clears throat> Thanks, Ambi. That's really awesome. Um, and Ambi was going to talk, um, do you mind mentioning just about how you applied it, how the fifth grade is applying that to their curriculum? Uh, yeah, doing the inventor's inventions thing. Uh, Thank you. Yeah. Awesome. Thanks. Um, Okay, so then our next module that we're going to talk about is digital fabrication, and Sammy is an expert on this topic. So, Sammy, take it away. Um, so, basically, um, for digital fabrication, we're using Tinkercad and the 3D printer. Um, that's for the skill, be skill building phase. We were just playing with it, trying to figure out all the controls and how to use it and then for our applying the skill we we were reading a book called Esperanza Rising and Mrs. McGregor combined that book and Tinkercad with it and we could create um, a medallion to describe our main character in the story for instance this main character in the story is Esperanza so I've made a medallion for Esperanza, and I picked strong because she was very, uh, she was very uplifting, and she she kept moving even if things got terrible and sad. Um, then after we choose the word to describe her, we pick two symbols to describe that word. I picked a heart and a diamond. For heart, uh, heart really keeps you going, and it always takes you to the next level, which is why I picked heart. And the diamond, I figured, would be perfect because it's the toughest material on Earth. So I feel like Esperanza was being really tough at a sad times, so I picked the diamond. Um, I loved this uh, opportunity so much that I created it my passion project. For my passion project, I made a basket using out of code blocks. There's a new module called Code Blocks from Tickercad, and I use that to create a basket. And that's not all. I also created a fidget spinner. It was really fun and exciting to see what I could create with code blocks in Tinkercad. Thank you. Thanks, Sammy. Um, and then the third module that we introduced at Russell Street was a coding module. Um, the fifth graders have not completed this module yet. This is gonna be in the spring for them, um, but they did participate in the Hour of Code. And I happen to have a coding expert with me, Ambi, who can talk to you a little bit about Scratch. <laughs> Uh, thank you. I wouldn't call myself an expert, but thank you anyway. Um, so the third and fourth graders, they are doing poetry. They are animating poetry. I think that's really cool. Uh, us fifth graders, I don't know what we're going to be doing yet. That's in the spring. So, uh, but we do have some experience with Scratch as we did the hour of code earlier in the school year. Um, so I... I did, I made an animation about a cat. Meow! <laughs> the cat goes into a different dimension accidentally and ends up in the evil weird dimension. Dun, 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 and he has to get home. So, um, that, is, that was really fun. And I finally finished it after, like, seven months of making it. I don't know. Uh... And I included a short video on uh, just a quick excerpt of the um, 
of the animation. Um, yeah, that's awesome, Ambie. So um, yeah, so this video will give you a sneak peek of how Scratch works um, and you can hear Ambie narrate it. So could you play this um, short video, please? Thank you. Hi, school committee meeting. This is Ambie with my Scratch Cats adventure in Scratch. Hello, he says. What's your name? My name's Ambie. Oh, but I forgot. He only takes usernames. This animation is interactive, as you probably can see. How are you? Personally, I'm pretty good today. Oh, that's awesome. He is too. He's going on an adventure. Ooh, I wonder where that'll take him. He's a very fast runner. Wow. What's that? It's a portal? Man, I wish there were portals in real life. Should he go in? Hmm. It's probably dangerous. I'm going to say no. Of course he doesn't listen to me. Do, 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 do. Ooh, he teleported. What is this place? Hmm. Evil Weird Dimension. Population. 1,726. Should he continue or should he quit? Personally, I think he should quit. Let's hope he listens to me this time. Phew, he did. Well, that is my Scratch Cats animation. If you had chosen to continue, you would have gone on a very, very, very far adventure just to get home. I hope you enjoyed this quick excerpt. Thanks. Bye. That was great, Ambi. Thank you so much. <clears throat> and watching that video, I realize I'm remiss. We have a second grader um, from slide two. Is, could we possibly go back to slide two? Because I have a second grader who made a short video to talk to you about our steam bags. <clears throat> so sorry about that. There she is. It's This is Mackenzie from Mrs. Ward's class, and she's going to demonstrate the steam bag. This is a house for the goose and the mouse so they don't bother Bayer and there's a zip line up top so they and there's a zip line so they can slide to like it can go up and down and this is like a little phone that this it's a phone case for them. Bye. Didn't she do a great job? Um, okay, so skipping back over to the next topic, which is our Teach the World YouTube channel um, that also is featured on Littleton Community Television. This is a student-run show, and as it turns out, both Ambi and Sammy have created content for this show. So um, Sammy is gonna talk to you a little bit about what it was like at, when it used to be an after-school club, um, but this year, um, we've shifted it to be part of our school day. So go ahead, Sammy. Um, so when I was in school, uh, I worked on Teach the World as an after-school club for about three weeks. Um, we met two, two days a week, I believe. And it was very fun to collaborate and share new ideas with my classmates in, the, in my group we made different segments and we learned about more about each other and learned to collaborate and listen to other people's ideas. And now Ambie's going to talk about what it's like to have it in school class. And we're having when we're making a video in my class. Thank you, Sammy. Yes. So we in school, we are doing it a bit differently as a group we choose a topic. So we are split into different groups. We choose a topic for each of those groups. My group is Minecraft Tips for Beginners. There's other groups like Fun Things to Do During COVID and Fake It. So, <clears throat> so we create a script first. That's the first step. Easy peasy. Then we create a video on Flipgrid. That video is then posted onto YouTube, LCTV, and the world. <laughs> Yeah, it's great to, for students to have a voice and, and they get to choose what they want to talk about. 
Um, so in our next video, there's just so many exciting things happening this year. Um, so in the next video um, and the next slide, sorry, um, we're going to talk about a, um, a school wide engineering challenge that we did at Russell Street School back in September um, called Pass the Peppers. And Sammy has um, a short video to share, but I think she wanted to say a quick introduction. I don't want to get I don't really want to give you guys too much about Pass the Peppers, so I'm just going to give you a short summary. So this is an all-school engineering challenge in Russell Street School. It's optional and self-paced, meaning that not everybody can do they don't if they don't want to do it and if it cl collides with their schedule, they don't need to do it if they don't want to. It's self-paced, meaning that whenever they have time, they look at the videos and they do what they need to do. But in the entire school, 176 students completed this project. And, and there's a new uh, kind of like pasta peppers related to STEM. It's called Make Every Frog Count. It's based on how we celebrate Earth Day. Um, and then Sammy has her actual Pass the Peppers project video attached here, if we could play that. We'll just play maybe the first 30 seconds or so, just so people get an idea of what she did. So- Hello, and welcome to my Pass the Peppers project. Today we're gonna show you how Michaela will pass the peppers over to grandma. So for this thing, we're gonna be representing the chairs as the building and the thread as the conveyor belt. Over here, I made some ingredient cards. And for instance, if grandma wanted peppers, she'd hook the pepper ingredient card onto the line. Then she's gonna pull the line all the way over to the other side. Isn't that amazing? So Samisha came up with this whole design for how this family would be able to pass peppers back and forth um, so that they could make salsa together. <clears throat> it's really great. Thank you, Sammy. Um, so the next one that we wanted to talk about was our pre-K to five virtual family STEM nights. Um, and this was a collaboration with the Empowering Families team at Russell Street School. So Susan Mitchell, um, Kat Dale, Rita McKinley, <laughs> and um, Amy Metcalf <clears throat> and I um, collaborated together uh, to plan this, this night. It was on February 2nd in the evening. We had 79 teams sign up, which um, counted as 297 participants. Um, and when folks came for the event, they were um, surprised to find out that the challenge was to create footwear with a purpose. Um, and it happened to be right after our first really big snowfall. So Giuseppe and his brother Vincenzo um, created shovel shoes and we thought you might wanna see it. So um, here's a quick video of their project. <laughs> Does your back ever hurt from bending over and shoveling? Oh, then I have advice for you. You should get shovel shoes. They work in the summer and winter. And they're very fun to use. There's no bending over involved with it. Because they're fun, 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 functional. functional. They are shovel shoes. And all we did to attach them, we put a shovel on the boot and we taped the shovel to the boot with the tape like around. And, and it's called the shovel shoe. You can use it in the summer, the, the spring, the sand, the, you can use it for any type of season. You can, you, I, all I did was put it on and then just kick. <laughs> 
So you can imagine how much fun we had that night when we had um, about 70 videos of really original footwear. <laughs> so the, um, there's one more slide, I believe, um, of just a, a recap of some of the other things that we've done with STEM this year, just to give you an idea of other things that are happening. Um, so we um, started a partnership with Al Nylum Pharmaceuticals, uh, thanks to Tim Buck, who work, who lives here in Littleton. Um, he set us up with visiting scientists who worked with our second, third, and fifth graders this year um, with virtual visits. Um, we've continued our digital citizenship program, K-5. to um, Some fourth graders are starting to um, do some mystery location calls um, as part of their social studies curriculum. Um, our first graders are studying animals, so um, we're going to introduce some um, augmented reality coloring sheets to, um, to add to that experience. Um, earlier in the year, in the fall, we did STEM story walks where students could go outside with their class, maybe have a little mask break or get some fresh air um, and um, read um, STEM um, stories that were posted on um, fences around uh, the school properties. Um, and then the other thing that's really exciting is we have a new laser cutter for Shakey's Imagitorium. So our Shaker Lane students are going to get their first taste of digital fabrication um, using a laser cutter, which um, was brought to us by a grant from the Littleton Education Fund and the Littleton Electric Light and Water Department. Um, so that brings us to the end of our um, our um, presentation, but we are here to answer any, oh, one more slide there. So I put the credits in the wrong spot. Um, if anyone has any questions. All right, that was awesome. <laughs> I have a question for Sammy and Amby. Is Imagitorium a real word or did you guys, somebody make that up? Like if I'd use that in Scrabble, would I get credit or would I be called a cheater? <laughs> I mean, personally, I'd say you would get full points, but. Right. I don't know. Well, we didn't really decide the name. It was all the whole credit went to Mrs. McGregor. We're not mm. in Shaker Lane anymore. I thought that might have been the answer to that question that it was Mrs. McGregor's fault. But so. um <laughs> if you if you tried to make up the name yourself, I think it would call you cheating. Okay. I appreciate that. Do any other school committee members have any questions for these bright people? No. All right. Thank you, guys. Appreciate it. Thank you, Heidi. Awesome, as always. Thank, Thank you, you, guys. Enjoy the rest of your school year, and uh, we'll see you back in the buildings uh, in September. All right? Yes. Fingers crossed. Thank you. Okay. All right. Continuing to say thank you. We're going to get an update on school. Do we want to start youngest to oldest? Sounds good. So assistant principal Deacon. Hi, how are you guys? I couldn't I couldn't hear what um, chair, the chairman said. I couldn't hear him at all. Oh, sorry. Um, just we're gonna get to our updates on the school-wide events. We're gonna start with Shaker Lane. Awesome, is somebody gonna pull up the slideshow? Mm -hmm. Okay. It's coming. <laughs> <laughs> Patience. All right. Awesome. Oh, go back. There we go. Nope. You can go. Okay. Now you can go one forward, Dorothy. <laughs> there we go. There we go, everybody. Um, I think, um, you know, even in, in the year that we have all had, I think we, we've all tried really hard to implement a lot of positive and, and fun activities for um, the school-wide community to be involved in. And I know Heidi mentioned actually a few that are on our list, but this year so far at Shaker Lane, um, we, we did a virtual community meeting, um, which was all about heart, which is obviously our school's, um, you know, grounding. Um, and so Mrs. Kane had sent that off to all the families and the kids, and they were able to watch it at home. Um, and our, pro our, our focus for that community meeting was on compassion, which actually led into our Coats uh, for Kids drive, 
Um, so that community meeting kicked off that event for us where families donated um, coats for families and kids in need. Um, Mrs. McGregor mentioned we've done the STEM story walks where she had the activities posted outside on the playground for the kids to read and, and take part in. Um, during the winter break, um, we sent um, a notice home to all families for them to send in photographs of things that they did over the winter vacation, just showing fun things that their family did. And then we created a whole video to share out with the school. Um, our remote learning snow day video, um, that was um, a, a fun way for Shaker Lane staff to send a video to all the families and reminding them all about um, COVID safety and all the guidelines that we have in place. I should have actually put the link here and shown that because I don't know if all of you got a chance to see that really fun staff video. We had a ball making that all together. Um, we always have our monthly spirit days, of course. Um, if any of you were in the building recently, we had a beautiful bulletin board, the 100 reasons why we love Shaker Lane, and the kids all wrote messages on hearts um, about why Shaker Lane is just a wonderful place to be. Um, quite a, about a month and a half ago or so, we had shaky story time evening, and on a Friday night, Many, many, many staff, along with the PTA, got together um, and we held our very first uh, bedtime story time. The kids picked up hot chocolate and coloring pages from the PTA, and then they all got in their jammies and they joined, joined all of us at night. And we all had segments to um, read our favorite stories to the kids. And I mean, there were some rooms sometimes that we had about 100 kids in a room listening to, to somebody reading a story. Um, so that was pretty magical. Um, uh, as Ms. McGregor mentioned, we had the K-5 to STEM night, and then we just recently had the virtual dance party with a DJ, and you can see some of the pics on the screen. The kids all dressed up in their finest and had glow sticks, and they just had a ball dancing to the music, and staff joined, so it was a great way to have some fun. You can go to the next slide, Dorothy. And then coming soon, um, we actually have our virtual Spring Fest, which is if any of you who have ever come to Shaker Lane for Winter Fest, it is typically our biggest um, night out and biggest fundraiser for Shaker Lane. And since we couldn't have that this year, the PTA um, was instrumental in creating our virtual Spring Fest coming up. And the kids are going to have an opportunity to stuff a shaky with Mrs. Kane. They're going to act like build a bear. They're going to actually stuff a tiger with Mrs. Kane. And there's a dance party and um, we can't have our cakewalk, famous cakewalk. So we're going to have a slideshow and just fun activities for families to participate in. Um, we're going to host a virtual paint night with which I believe Kristen Hemis, our very own art teacher, will be leading that night. Um, we have a scavenger hunt coming up. And of course, the district wide K through 12 STEM night, which we are all getting very excited for. And Heidi has been, um, McGregor has been instrumental in giving clues to the kids every single day and sending out little snippets here and there. And Mrs. Kane and I have been announcing things in the morning, giving them clues about what the next STEM night is going to be. So she asked the assistant principals if we could help join her in creating a, a launching video for um, the K to 12 district um, STEM night. So I thought it'd just be fun for everybody to watch the quick um, minute or snow seat sneak peek K to 12 STEM night video. Let's hope it plays, right, Dorothy? <laughs>
just, I just love that video. Um, so I know at Shaker Lane, I posted it in all the Google Classrooms, the Seesaw accounts. Um, so the kids all got it first thing in the morning for their morning announcement and they got to watch the video and kids are definitely starting to, to talk about it and trying to figure out what's it all about. So uh, they're sure to have a really good time. So things are happening at Shaker Lane. Great, thank you. You're welcome. You okay, so I guess, Street? yeah, yep. absolutely. Um, so good evening, Chairman Fontanella and members of the school committee. Um, I'm also excited to share um, that Russell Street has continued to organize and provide um, a wide variety of school-wide activities um, throughout the school year. And I'm gonna highlight what those are for all of us this evening. So um, as Heidi has mentioned earlier this evening, um, we had two STEM events. Um, past the Pepper Challenge, as well as the Pre-K to 5 Virtual Family STEM Night. Um, we also were um, able to enjoy um, STEM story walks on the outside um, or on the grounds of our school um, during recess times and throughout the school day, um, which was just a really great opportunity for students to um, have different kinds of movement challenges and solve different kinds of um, problems. Um, November 6th, we were able to enjoy a virtual school-wide presentation sponsored by the PTA. We had Rob Surrett, um, an artist, share his journey as an artist. Um, and at the very end, he painted a painting of Martin Luther King that is now hanging in our school cafeteria. And then um, following that, at the end of December, on Wednesday, December 23rd, we um, had a school-wide virtual assembly and holiday sing-along, which, um, which was a really fun culminating activity to celebrate all of the students who participated in the Pass the Pepper Challenge, um, as well as the upcoming winter break. Um, and Charlie Sullivan led us in uh, three or four winter songs um, together as a school community, which was really fun. Um, the other thing that I'm excited to share is that um, we had two teachers, Jess Schofel and Heather Love, put in a request for our outdoor classroom blackboard um, to be updated earlier this past fall. So the PTA was very generous in supporting that update. And so now we're ready to go as the weather's getting nicer um, to welcome students back out into the outdoor classroom um, with that updated um, Blackboard space. And then we also had a very successful PTA book fair um, this winter with a new partnership with the Silver Unicorn Bookstore in West Acton. Um, you know, obviously we had to change things up a little bit this year in terms of how we um, organized the book fair, um, but the photograph that's included on the bottom is a quick snapshot of how we um, organize the books for delivery, and then um, deliver them out to classrooms. So that was um, a very successful um, book fair. Um, Dorothy, you can go on to the next slide, please. Thank you so much. Um, we also had a Russell Street Kindness Challenge Week that took place um, at the end of January, which was a whole school activity. We're happy to announce that we collected 171 pounds of food that was then donated to Loaves and Fishes, um, as well as students making notes for the Council on Aging for their Meals on Wheels program. That was um, a really nice um, activity that many students joined in on. Um, and down here on the bottom, our fun stripes visited our school and joined both cohorts throughout the week, as well as our remote classrooms. Um, so that was a real fun surprise for many. Um, we had um, our Potato Hill Poetry, which is an annual working, um, excuse me, annual writing workshop for students in grades three and four, has continued um, this year virtually instead of um, having um, Andrew Green come in. Um, he has done that virtually for our students, also funded by the PTA. Um, and we also have an upcoming game night um, towards the end of March, beginning of May, um, excuse me, beginning of April, also funded by the PTA. 
Um, one of the things that we just really want to highlight is that, you know, throughout this whole entire school year, it's really been about the small daily expressions of caring that um, have made our days unique and special. For example, the cafeteria staff, um, you know, oftentimes will write positive messages on the pizza boxes for students. Um, and it's those little gestures that really um, bring smiles to everybody's faces during the day. So um, we're really excited and proud of the things that we have incorporated into our days. Um, and we look forward to adding more um, as the year progresses. All right, great, thank you, Andrea. Moving on to the middle school. That's me. <clears throat> Hello, everyone. I hope everyone had an opportunity to go out and enjoy this beautiful weather we've been having. It was, uh, it was unbelievable. Uh, at the middle school, um, we've had some fun things happening this year, and uh, I will talk about a couple of them tonight. We've had a couple spirit days. Uh, we had a, a football jersey day early in the school year where we were all subjected to Mr. Everhart wearing his Seahawks jersey and really expressing his love for the West Coast. Um, tomorrow, uh, we will be starting our celebration of Pi Day, which actually falls on Sunday this year, 3, uh, 314, to signify 3.14, and then a lot of other numbers that our math teachers uh, are a little better, better than me at. So I went to Worcester and picked up 432 mini tabletop pies today that were donated free of charge from the Tabletop Pie Company that will help with sort of uh, that celebration, all individually boxed and, and very socially distant. Um, that was a nice collaboration with them. Uh, we had some intramural basketball where our sixth grade social studies teacher, uh, Connor O'Sullivan helped out. Uh, we had great participation with the kids. Um, we have uh, student council that uh, Diane Tricana runs and they are they are trying to plan a couple of things in the spring to sort of get, you know, things going in a, in a, in a more celebratory direction going, uh, going forward. And then we also have National Junior Honor Society, um, something I was not a member of in middle school. Um, but that is run by Amy Tatro and Valerie Finnerty, and they're doing a wonderful job. But coming up uh, in spring 2021, so if we could hit the next slide. We are going to have the science fair. Uh, we're gonna do um, a whole spirit week that I know Mr. Kana is really working on with student council. We will have spring intramurals, um, a variety of games that Greg Gillette is gonna run. We are gonna have archery club, which will be run by Trish Bonacore and Todd Shoemaker. They're super excited about that. And then we're also gonna offer art club, which will be run by Matt Leonard, who is our wonderful art teacher. We're hoping to add a few more things, but right now this is what we have sort of locked down moving forward. Uh, you know, again, we've got great, um, great things going on, great participation by the kids. Um, it's a, you know, it's a, an exciting place to be. Awesome, thank you, Matt. And Keith, before you get started, I just want to say it would have been a lot more impressive in that video if you spun that globe on your finger like a basketball. I, I heard that feedback. It was hard with the the frame to the globe. Yeah, yeah, yeah. If we're easy, everyone would do it. You know, I what know. I mean? <laughs> <laughs> All right. So what we got going at the high school? Um, we've had a lot of opportunity to keep our a lot of our clubs going. Uh, we haven't had as many like school wide events that. Um, like Shaker Land and Russell has had, but we've had a lot of our more traditional clubs that have been able to continue their meetings um, with some adjustments to have a lot more virtual meetings. We've really been focused on, you know, making sure that we're able to keep kids connected with the, the events they've been part of kind of throughout their high school careers. A few highlights, there's a lot on on this slide, but we had kids participate in the academic decla decathlon. They participated in the basically the tryout event for the high school quiz show. They did really well, but didn't qualify for the, the live taping of the high school quiz show. Um, the NEMO, New England Math League, we've been doing that for many years now. Um, this year was virtual, but our, our students have participated in um, six events, uh, which are math contests that our students very um, often do very well in. 
the NHS has been very active this year. Um, they've done town cleanups around uh, different parts of the town. They put together a mural painting in the World Language Wing. Um, they've done a library book sale. They've organized peer tutoring. So the, the NHS has been active as always. The yearbook uh, club this year is actually a class. Uh, Mr. Orzak from the library is teaching the yearbook class and we've had students engaged throughout the year and really putting a lot of effort into designing the yearbook for this year and doing a lot of um, really creative things in terms of how they're organizing the book itself, how they're doing team photos for athletics, using green screens. And so Mr. Orzak has been really integral in, in putting that together. The Pals Club with the old Best Buddies Club, they've had virtual movie nights where the, the kids have been sent home with like popcorn and snacks from the movie and they all watch a movie together on um, on a Zoom or Google Meet. Bio Olympiad has, has competed as it has in the past, but with the virtual uh, platform as uh, pretty common throughout this course of the year. The Green Team, the Diversity Club, the Knitting Club, Spanish Club, Latin Club, they've all been meeting fairly regularly um, virtually, but then having a, a few in-person events um, you know, as spacing permits. There have been a couple of kind of anonymous kindness projects that happened over the past few weeks. Um, there was one group that put together uh, these like large displays with every student's name in each class. So they had a senior project or poster, a junior poster, a sophomore poster, a freshman poster with every kid's name uh, in a little heart. Uh, I was put up around Valentine's Day. There was another group that put together um, kind of anonymous kindness notes that were left around the building for either students or staff. Um, I'll keep their identities still anonymous because they've had some ongoing work um, with that project. So if you go to the next slide, please. Some upcoming events. Um, again, there, there are things happening and going to be more things happening as we get started into the spring. Next week is our spirit week. Um, actually, it begins tomorrow with some of the class uh, officers with their hallway decorating, uh, which is one of the traditional events of the Spirit Week. We're doing it before Spirit Week this year, so that way everyone can see the decorations in both cohorts um, as they progress through next week. We'll have a variety of um, themed days for student participation in the Spirit Week. Um, the, the Pennies for Patients uh, collection is part of the Spirit Week competition. Each class donates for Pennies for Patients for the, the, the Lymphoma and Leukemia Society. I apologize for that. Um, the Polar Plunge is another fundraising event for Special Olympics that's organized and will be happening in, in, in the spring. There is going to be a Power Cup football game that is in the works. It typically happens around Thanksgiving. Um, will be happening in April. Um, there are some plans for um, some art club events, a virtual Bob Ross paint night, a, outdoor chalk drawings are, are all in discussion. Um, there's a lot of talk right now about senior class activities and kind of organizing things to make the end of senior year um, memorable for the senior class uh, as they've gone through a really difficult year uh, so far with everything being canceled pretty much. Um, and the LHS Press newspaper is getting ready to publish their spring edition of uh, their publication. The next part of my presentation isn't actually from me, but actually from Adam DeCoast, who is our drama director. And he's gonna talk a little bit about what the drama club has been up to over the past year. So I'll turn it over to Adam. Thank you. Um, hi, everybody. So uh, yeah, I'm going to tell you a little bit about what LHS drama has been up to. And uh, our, our kind of driving force has been that masks never bothered us anyway, to paraphrase Frozen. Um, we can go on to the next slide. So this fall, we started, um, once we kind of made a game plan of how we can do some theater and be socially distant and, and do everything safely. We started with monologue meetings to get everything kind of rolling. Um, students are, were meeting with me um, in a one-on-one in -on -one setting to be able to learn some skills that they would be able to use in performances or auditions. Um, so they chose from six monologues that I you know, offered to them. And we had some meetings, so I could give them some coaching. And then eventually they got to have a little performance in a more audition-like setting with me and uh, a couple of others in the room. Um, and they got to learn how to break down a performance that is on their own, which is sometimes not 
a highlight or, or a, some, not always something I can focus on in a typical rehearsal setting. So it was awesome to be able to give them, give them some tools to be able to go and use that uh, when they're preparing for, for future performances. Um, and then we did some scenes, which kind of kept with the same theme. So we, we kept, we had a few scenes with two people and then um, one scene had, had three in it. And we were able to, you know, keep the numbers down and, but still get people in the auditorium and performing. And we were able to do both the monologues and these scene studies in person, which was awesome. Um, and again, kind of giving them some, some building blocks to translate into a full length performance, learning how to break down a scene and how to uh, actively act, which is easier said than done. Um, and play off each other, listen to each other, all these kinds of tools that, that are actually right now, as I'll get into, are, are showing themselves to, to have been very useful. Um, and we filmed for a few of these scenes. We didn't get to do one of them because of scheduling. Um, and it's actually the one student who uh, it might actually be listening right now through one of the school committee members audios is one of the ones we didn't get to film, unfortunately. Um, Stella Austin was in that scene uh, doing the dining room, but we did get to film uh, three hour town scenes and an important of being, importance of being earnest scene, um, which was a lot of fun. Um, so we, and we still haven't screened them. So we, we're, we're waiting for the right moment to get a good screening in for these, at least for the students who were involved. And then we did this, I, you know, just trying to come up with anything we can and, and came up with this program that I ended up calling Unsung Heroes, where we performed song lyrics as if they were monologues. We completely removed the music and the, the, the poetry from it and just performed it like it was just a straight monologue. Um, and the students who attended those those were uh, on Google Meet and some of them would record it and submit it ahead of time. Some would perform it live. Uh, and I was, I was performing them in there with them. And we had a lot of fun just kind of taking something that has a certain form and replacing it with, with a different form and seeing, seeing how it made it different and, and just getting to laugh at each other. Um, so that was fun. We had some teams, there were winners and, lots of laughter. So that was our fall semester. And now we're in spring, uh, which is the next slide. And we started in January with a couple of Shakespeare workshops because we're rehearsing right now, Romeo and Juliet. Um, so we did some Shakespeare workshops again to give some building blocks so that right now in rehearsals, my job's easier and they feel more confident coming to rehearsals. So it's, it's, uh, it's been a lot of fun. Just kind of looking at, you know, scansion, iambic pentameter, the words Shakespeare uses that we don't use now or we use in a different way or all of those kinds of things, the syntax, the grammar um, in those workshops to, so that students could read it and, and feel like they could perform it at auditions more confidently. And then we had auditions at the end of January. And now we're in rehearsals for Romeo and Juliet. And instead of doing a traditional staged play, we're actually filming Romeo and Juliet and essentially making a movie. So we're, we're really leaning into to the movie making style of it. And we're not even filming it straight through. We're using the playgrounds around Littleton as our set. So we're using Castle in the Trees as like Central Verona, if you're familiar with the play. Uh, Russell Street playgrounds are where the Capulets and you know Juliet are always hanging out um, and where they throw their party. And then Shaker Lane kind of fills in some more gaps where the Friar is, where um, Romeo's banished and, and all these other things. So we're filming, eventually going to be filming our our movie on those playgrounds so it's it's been a lot of fun to to be in rehearsals in the auditorium still in our small groups and 
all in, in masks. And I point at a picture of the, the playground on, on my Chromebook and say, all right, and then you go down the slide and then you go up the ladder and then you do, and then you go up and then we're over here. And um, we actually got to today, go over to Castle in the Trees with such nice weather and, and uh, play on the playgrounds with all the small children um, and rehearse our scenes out there. So it's, it's a lot of fun. And the students are, are really embracing the, we're filming on a playground uh, mentality. Um, and and the, the fun thing about doing a movie is I don't have a ton of experience with movies. Um, and I know the students don't either. So we're all kind of learning as we go how, how this process differs from theater. And, and we're going to be able to bring some new skills to theater. Um, and we, we've been collaborating with Tiger's Den to, to be able to schedule our filming, uh, as well as Parks and Rec that is helping us out a bunch. Um, LCTV is, is, is helping us as well. The art club and the sewing committee are helping us the, the art club with some poster art and whatnot. The sewing committee is helping us make masks so that we have the masks are part of our costumes. Um, and it, yeah, it's, We've, we're getting help from all over and it's really been a lot of fun to be able to kind of pull from all directions and get a, a big collaborative effort to get this show going forward. Um, and finally, we encourage volunteers because we're making a movie and that's a lot more work than any of us ever imagined. Um, so if anyone's interested in helping us out, we're, we're um, my email is lhsdrama at littletonps.org and I'm happy to to get more hands on deck. So that's what LHS drama is up to right now. And we're having a lot of fun. Great. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Uh, you guys all cited various uh, staff members who are helping out with all these efforts. Uh, we know that these extracurricular activities really, especially the, the clubs and uh, things like that wouldn't function without our staff going above and beyond the normal school day. Uh, in normal times, it, it's, you know, very important, but obviously in, in what we're going through, it's more difficult, but obviously even more meaningful than normal. So we appreciate as a school committee, all that extra effort that people are making, and we understand how valuable it is to our students. So thank you very much for that. Any other school committee members have any comments on, on what we just heard? Brad? Yeah, I just want to thank every, everyone for those presentations. We've heard a couple of times about what's happening with athletics because we had to take some votes on it and decide. Um, we haven't heard as much about these other things, but I'm just so impressed with the, the range of activities and opportunities you're giving our students. And just want to say thanks. I think it's good for the committee and the community to know about all these things. So thank you. All right, awesome. All right, appreciate that. Thank you. Uh, next on the agenda, we were going to have a presentation from Dr. Joseph Allen, uh, but he unfortunately had a late last minute conflict. Uh, so we will work with him uh, to see if we can get him rescheduled for another meeting. So that will take us right into our public health uh, metrics update. So do we have Katrina with us to talk about that? I am still here. Um, first, I have to tell you, I think I need some um, some teaching by those fifth graders because I think a little stop action animation might enter make my slides more entertaining. <laughs> um, they were amazing. And so they thank had you for sharing them. They had a lot of sound effects, Katrina. And I they did. That. You know, I little little scratch programming might also help me. Um, and I have to say, since we're doing recognitions and things too, I would like to recognize Kevin Davis. Um, the data keeps getting posted later and later, and he has been invaluable to me of like pulling it off this website and um, putting it in a form that I literally can pop in and just do the analysis really quickly, which gives me more time to think about what it means. So um, if you guys see Kevin Davis around, can you please thank him for the support he has provided to this, um, this part of the endeavor for the rest of the year. I'm really thankful for him. So let's get right into this stuff. So I know today's a long meeting and I don't want to take forever. There's a lot of good stuff to talk about. So we'll jump right into the state. Um, so we are officially a year in. Um, one year ago, the WHO 
made a statement that we are in a pandemic and here we are a year later and things have still still going along, but there's a lot of good things that we're looking at too. Um, so on the front page of the dashboard, um, the DPH reported that there has been 563,983 cases, confirmed cases in our state and 16,218 confirmed deaths. So there's, our state had a, a large impact, especially at the beginning before anyone knew anything, um, um, especially with the deaths. And so it's, um, I did hear this week that we've officially have more people vaccinated with a first dose than we do have case confirmed cases. So that's a nice little metric to um, keep our eye on. Um, so there's some hope ahead. Um, so the, here are the four main metrics that we always track. Um, the state now reports about 1300 cases per day. Test positivity is about 1.76% and hospitalizations are about 700 per day and deaths average about 32 per day. So everything's kind of flattened over the last couple of weeks across the state. Uh, we're no longer doing that deep dive down. So if we go to local data, um, let's see, Littleton had 17 cases um, over the last two week period, which was from February 21st to March 6th. Um, so the two weeks before that we had 20 cases. Um, so that means this is the third week in the yellow, which is great, we're kind of holding steady, we're not um, jumping back up, we're not continuing down, but with small numbers, it's we bounce around a little bit. So this, we're holding steady at this point, and we're similar to where we were in late October, early November. So when we look at the average daily incidence rate per 100,000 people for Littleton and also the surrounding area, um, Littleton's rate was 12.4 per 100,000, which again is flat compared to two weeks ago. Um, and the rates for the areas that we track have also slowed or flattened over the last two weeks. So again, we're kind of in that holding pattern at this point. Um, and I'll get to that in a recap in the end. And then again, here's the total test positivity. So the number of people who test positive over the total number of tests conducted by the state. Um, our number of tests were positivity, sorry, the test positivity this week was 1.46%, which was actually similar to last week. It was about 1.5% last week as well. Um, like the rate, the downward trend here in Littleton and also the areas that we track appear to have slow or flattened again. So we're just kind of in this holding pattern. Um, and as there's some concern about which way we're going, we're kind of in this inflection point and it's like this across the United States. It's not just here. Um, that we're kind of holding steady and when things hold steady and things open up, that tends in the past to have increased the rates after a few weeks of um, opening. So that's a concern right now, um, but we do have vaccinations rolling out. We have other things. So there's a balancing act and it's not sure how that's gonna impact at the moment. So again, we're in holding pattern. Um, but the nice thing is the schools have been holding without cases this so far this week. Um, last week we had one case and reported through the health notification letters. This week we haven't had any to date. Um, Lynn Snow shared with me that of the seven pooled testing days so far, there have been zero positive pools, which is an amazing um, thing to think about. And that in the newsletter that the schools send out every week, it was shared in that that 99% um, of the pools across the state, according to DESE, were also negative. So that's really reassuring as we're talking about returning to school and keeping track of things to like to know that at this point when the rates have come down and kind of steadied, that um, that is also showing in our school that it's very, um, very low percentage. Um, so again, I just wanna touch base that it's this test um, pool testing program is actually a really great tool for our toolkit. Um, the more people that participate, the more robust the tool is. Um, and it's just great to keep an eye on things. So if cases do start to arise in our community, we can see whether they're in the school or if they're not in the school, but the community rates are rising, we can be assured that the schools should stay open. Um, so I really, really, really encourage people to consider consenting in to the um, test positivity, sorry, the pooled testing program, especially as we're considering um, bringing more kids back into the building. So I'm very thankful to hear that there's a teacher vaccination program um, that seems to be unrolling and also they're eligible and that people are starting to get them. 
Um, starting tomorrow, the state actually is changing their vaccine appointment system for everyone else, um, including teachers. The teachers can get in through this way too. Um, so the state will be using a pre-registration system to make it easier, in theory anyway, to mm -hmm. schedule at one of the seven mass vaccination locations. Um, and they're with plans to add more sites in April when the supply increases. So once you pre-register, it, it looks as though you will receive an updated, a weekly update um, from the state via your text messages or however you get messages. And then um, when an appointment is available, they'll kind of plop you in it and you have 24 hours to confirm and accept the appointment. So, and you can opt out if you do happen to get a um, vaccine at another location that's not through the state. So it is very clear that due, the, due to the constrained federal supply, it's gonna take several weeks to get through um, the people who are currently eligible for vaccinations, um, but you can still pre-register and they'll fill it in as you can. Um, but one of the more exciting um, vaccine related news this week was the CDC's release of the interim guidance for fully vaccinated people. So there's this um, carrot of things that's going to happen once you are fully vaccinated, or you'll be more able to do things. Um, I'm not going to run through that in detail tonight, just because of time. I did summarize it at the Board of Health meeting yesterday. So that's recorded if someone wants to return to it, or I'm happy to answer questions if people have questions. But again, like more people who get vaccinated, the more things um, we can really slow the spread of COVID and we can start returning to things as normal as possible. So before I leave, um, here we are, that one year from where the world just kind of turned on its head. And there's a lot of hope and there's a lot of changes and things happened, you know, vaccines happened really fast and um, that's a blessing. Um, we're at a point where businesses are reopening, schools are reopening, the sun is shining, and it feels kind of like the world's coming out of hibernation. Um, and these are all really great things, really full of hope, and that there's a finish line in front of us that we're going to, we're, we're approaching. Um, but I've, I've got the flip side of that, and I hate to say the but, but it's here. Like the cases and test positivity have flattened in our state. We're not continuing down, um, and the lower we can get the cases, the easier the vaccines have the job to do and help protect everyone in the community, not just those vaccinated. So um, given our past reopening experience in our state over the next few weeks, um, these, we're in critical inflection period over the next few weeks. So COVID is still around and the variants are a concern to keep an eye on. The things that we have done to prevent spread in schools, things like that should continue to help prevent spread with the variants. Um, but Although we are done with COVID, COVID is not done with us. So it remains really important that everyone continues to use all these many layers of cheese in the cheese block as many times as you're around anyone outside of your household. So whether that's in public or private, at work, at school, in any activity, wherever you're hanging out with other people you don't live with, please put on a mask, do everything you can to keep your distance. Um, make sure outdoors is safer than indoors, all the things we keep talking about. So um, we've talked about them, you guys know them, let's just keep using them. So wear a well-fitting mask, get vaccinated when it's your turn. Um, and hopefully over the next few weeks as vaccines continue to roll out and get into arms that we will, will be less pressure. Like we're just at a critical point right now. So it's really important people really stick to the guidelines, even though it feels like the world's opening up right now. So keep up the good work. We're almost there. And, um, and I can't wait until most of us have our vaccines, because I think it really will change the dynamic of what we're talking about. All right. Thank you, Katrina. Any questions or comments for Katrina? All right. Brad? I don't know if it's for Katrina or Lynn Snow. Um, you know, we've mentioned the a couple of times the percentage of, of, of students who are participating in the, the pool testing. Um, if I recall correctly, we settled in a little above 60% a couple of weeks ago. Is that still where we are, Lynn? Okay. Thank you. All right. All right. Thank you, Katrina. Appreciate it as always. And if we do see Kevin around, we will give him a pat on the back as well. Thank you. So I'll it, like a wave towards like we were patting <laughs> him on the back without elbow actually. bump. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. All right. Uh, I do see one hand up, uh, Dorothy. Uh, do you want to see if, if Brandon wants to make a comment? Hello? 
Yep. Your and your oh, can you guys hear me okay? Yes, we can. Uh, um, my question was for uh, uh Brandon, sorry, sorry. Can you oh. just give us your name and address just for the record? Sure, it's uh, Brandon Baker, 15 Boxwood Drive. Thank you. Um, my question was for Shaker Lane. Um, my question is that I'm concerned with the lack of transparency and the decision to bring select kids back to the school. I'm happy for the kids who were chosen to go back full time early, but why was it decided to not tell the parents through a general letter about what was going on? Uh, Dr. Clenchy or Michelle, do you want to address that? Oh man, I can I can start. It's up to you. Yep, go ahead, Dr. Clenchy. Then you can you can jump in too, Michelle, if you'd like. Uh, as, as per the, the DESE protocols, when we first engaged in, in uh, responding to COVID-19, uh, we were encouraged and, and actually directed would be a more appropriate word to make sure that, that students that, that needed services or accommodations uh, were given priority and uh, mm -hmm. offered four days a week. We did implement the, implement part of that phase in, in September. We felt a week or two ago that it was time to reassess where we were and uh, take a look at any other students that, that perhaps were struggling and uh, following those protocols, uh, identified students that could benefit from four days of, of in learning. This is not atypical to what we would do every year, although it is an atypical year. So, we would love to bring more students back, but I think tonight you're, you're gonna be involved or listen to a discussion uh, about what we're gonna be doing in the next couple of weeks or few weeks. But uh, we, we have to maintain at this point in time, uh, six feet of distancing, which restricts what we can do in terms of the number of students that, that we can bring back. So to, to send a general letter out would have uh, put us in, in a, uh, tenuous spot in terms of uh, violation of FERPA rights, because every child uh, has that right for that information in terms of accommodations uh, to be confidential. Okay, I'm still a little, so is, I'm trying to find right way to put this, because I want all the kids back just as you guys do. I just, I had my daughter come home crying that she's not not that she's not special, but the school hates her because her friends are all going full time and she's not. I got other parents telling me that they feel the same way. And the last thing I want to do is send my child to school and, and a year that's like this where no one's no one's ready for it. But to have her already, she used to love school and now it's just getting worse and worse. And this kind of set her over the edge. So as a parent, I, I just want to I'm just trying to get a feel of. How do I put this? I, I just want to know what's going on. You know, why my child's coming out of school saying, you know, the school hates me, everything's not, I, I don't want to go back because I, you know, five of my friends can go in, but I can't. So, yeah, we, we appreciate that, Brandon. It's, it's, and I, it's I mean, I mean, no disrespect. I'm not trying to start anything. Yeah. I mean, no disrespect. It's just a crazy year. Everything's going on. You know, you see your child crying and you're already, you're already trying yeah. very hard with the hybrid. So I just want to make sure of my, you know, the, my kid is taken care of. Right. We appreciate that. And we're trying to take care of all the kids. As Dr. Clenchy mentioned, the way we did this particular effort, there was a significant amount of, uh, you know, how we, how we always identify kids who we think need more support or need, you know, more services at school. There's significant confidentiality issues about how that mm -hmm. is conducted. So this wasn't an effort it's, this was different than what's going to happen in all likelihood in the next couple of weeks, which is a broad based effort. Uh, this was a targeted effort and the targeting and the methodology requires confidentiality. So that's why we would not have chosen to, you know, we did talk about it at school committee. So people understood that there was a, you know, beginning of a phased approach for, for thinking about how we could increase the amount of in-person learning, but the actual implementation because of the nature of this particular aspect of the implementation required a, a sig significant level of confidentiality. It wasn't something that we were opening up to the community at large for, we had reasons for that um, because of primarily because of the distancing. Um, we wish we, you know, we could have done that earlier. We think we're going to be able to do it now. Um, we'll talk about that later tonight, but that's really the reason that that particular phase happened in the way it did. Okay. And thank you for answering that. And, and again, I mean, I mean, no disrespect. You guys are doing nope. a tremendous job. I just, 
I want to just know everything that's going on with, with my child because you hate yep. to see them upset when they come home. All the teachers, everyone's doing fantastic. Yep. Thank you. Thank you. Next question. Well, Jen Wilson, please state your name, your street, and your question, please. Hi there. Um, this is Jennifer Wilson, 63 Foster Street. Um, I want to thank Katrina for the amazing information and Brad, that was really helpful to um, know that there has not been a change in the pooled testing. I'm wondering what kind of measures are being taken right now to um, get more students involved because I feel like that is one really missing um, you know, component to get the kids back to school. Um, and it would be helpful to have a lot more children um, taking, um, you know, part of that. Thank you. Lynn or Dr. Clinchy, are there any ongoing efforts to continue to educate people about why they might want to choose to participate if they haven't already? Sure. Oh. Yes, we have, oh. um, really tried to increase and we're, we're stuck around that mid sixties range, I think, cause there's been some flux in, um, more students coming in, which kind of changes our denominator. Um, I will say that we did do a parent, um, a parent forum this past Thursday and did receive an additional 53 consents, which was great. Um, but because there's been some additional students that have been brought in, it's not moving our percentage. Um, but uh, what I can say is that right now between staff and students, I think we have 718 consents, which is great. But if we could kind of just break over that cusp of to a thousand, that would be really, really fantastic. I think the pool testing is going well. It's um, very relatively low response effort. It's not time consuming. Um, so if anybody has questions or they're on the fence, please reach out. But um, I think that the parent forum was definitely helpful in um, prov providing parents information. Great questions were asked. Um, I put all of the questions that came up into the weekly uh, update that we send out. And um, we will definitely be thinking of creative um, ideas to try to incentivize getting more consents as well. We've, we've talked a little bit about maybe doing a lottery, an incentive, some type of um, uh, initiative to get those consents up so that the percentage is meaningful. All right, great. Thank you. All right. Moving on, speaking of pool testing, the next topic on the agenda is a discussion on the extension. We were in a kind of a pilot phase. Dr. Clenchy, where are we at with the, the, the pool testing program and then transitioning? Sure, there is a, a typo in the uh, agenda this evening. The program was extended to April 18th. Uh, originally, it was uh, slotted to end on March 28th. So, a couple of things for this evening. We, we really need to make a decision whether or not we're extending to April 18th or perhaps consider putting both feet in the water and uh, making a decision to continue pool testing to the end of the school year. So I know that the, 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 the deadline was extended. The funding was extended as well. Is that correct? Uh, that's correct. Right. So the state is going to continue to fund the program through April 18th. Is that correct? Yes. Okay. And then the question would be, do we want to participate in the program beyond April 18th? And if we do, ostensibly, we would uh, be responsible for the remaining funding and cost of the program. Um, so we can, as Dr. Clinchy said, we can just kind of keep rolling the way we are and, and, and wait to decide, wait you know, down the road to decide if we want to continue uh, or we can make that decision now. I'm looking for any input from school committee members. Justin? Sure. Um, I, I don't see any certainly downside to participating through April 18th when it's covered by the state. I think that brings us right to April vacation and, you know, uh, social activities are likely going to change around, you know, during that week. So we're probably going to want to strongly consider with the pool testing program and potentially, um, you know, run it through the entire year as we're bringing back the middle school around that time or the high school around that time. Um, we're going to have to take a hard look at what it's going to cost us on a weekly or monthly basis um, and what the results are showing us. So certainly no time to quit. Um, but it, can we just wait until like the first or second week of April to 
talk about May and June, or does there do we have to get in or out at some point? I don't. I don't think we have to get in or out now. Uh, I think uh, the, the Dr. Clinton, Do we know like if if the uh, if they extended the deadline to 18th, like the 18th, the drop dead date, or is that just the last day that you, if you you have to notify them on the 11th that you're going to stop, and then you just get to finish out till the 18th? Do we know exactly? Right. We we don't have a, an exact date yet, but in, in fairness to the vendors, uh, they do need some time to to uh, retool if they need to, if, if districts are going to drop out or, or stay involved. We, we do need to, whatever decision we make this evening, uh, we have a clause in the uh, Littleton Educators Association uh, MOA regarding pool testing. Uh, we were going we're to have to sit down with the union and, and uh, have that conversation, even if we extend it to April 18th, because we have a, a deadline uh, of... Uh, stopping the program currently March 28th. So again, it depends on uh, what you want to do. The cost, Justin, uh, with the increased uh, time where we don't have to pay is still going to be between $110,000 and $114,000 till the end of the school year. Okay, I think just for everybody's reassurance, I mean, 100 grand, 115 grand, I think, you know, um, that we would all likely support that. Um, well, that's where I'm at with that. And that would be covered through our SR2 grant that, that we've been awarded. Anybody else? Brad? Yeah, so if I understand correctly, um, Kelly, that the, the March 28th date is because the original motion was for a six week participation. Is that correct? The motion that we passed? Uh, yes. Okay. So, Mike, do we need a, a vote tonight to extend at least April 18th, and then we can revisit this later? I can tell you I will almost certainly vote to continue it. It's um, one of the CDC's mitigation, named mitigation things. If we're, if we're going to, um, to get under the six feet distance, then I would encourage us to keep all the other measures in place. Um, so for that cost, especially if it's going to be covered by federal grant, I'm, I'm almost certainly going to vote for it. But without having that debate tonight, um, if we need a motion to extend at least through April 18th, I'm happy to make that motion. All right. Um, and just for clarification, too, I think that minimally we should probably think about doing that. If, if there's no consensus to make a final decision, which is fine, then I think minimally we should make that motion. And then uh, that would uh, trigger us to go back to the LEA and just let, because when we negotiated that original date with the LEA, that was before the extension by the state. That's when we thought the deadline was going to be. So we would just need to go to them and just let them know that uh, it's our intention to keep going through the state uh, pilot period, even though it's been extended, and just make sure they're on board with that. Um, we are meeting with them next week anyway, so we can just add that into uh, that meeting. Um, and that would be the process for that if we decided tonight to continue with the extended deadline. Matt or Timlin? Timlin? No, I would just go, oh, Matt. Sorry. Bad Matt. Matt. Yeah, my Matt. birthday. I'm talk. Okay. <laughs> um, yeah, I would just concur that. You know, it's a no-brainer to at least extend it to the April 18th, and you know, I would also be in support in extending it to the end of the year, just as one of the mitigation strategies that we have in place. I have to agree with everything everyone else said. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, I'd be in support of through the 18th and through the end of the school year. All right. I, I think personally, uh, I think it would be from a process perspective, because we are uh, under an MOA with the LEA specific to this, that uh, we vote to extend tonight and then get with them and see what they're thinking, because we haven't really gotten any feedback from them. Uh, it's only been a few weeks that we've been in it. But I think that we it would be a good opportunity for us to take advantage of the meeting next week to see what they're thinking. And uh, we can certainly uh, let them know that it seems like the consensus of the school committee is to continue through the end of the year and we can gauge what their response to that would be. And uh, once we have that information, I think it would be easier for us to make a final determination at, an, at a future meeting about uh, going through the end of the school year. Yeah, Mike, I think that's really appropriate, but um, I, we, I would want to see the numbers. You know, we're saying, I agree with Justin that, you know, $100,000 um, 
of, of grant money to give us this peace of mind and the information we need is, is useful. But I, I do want to see the number if we're going to vote to spend public money. So okay. but I, I, do you need a motion now? Yeah, let's go ahead and do that. Uh, I move that we, um, that we continue to participate in the pool testing program until April 18th. I second that emotion. <laughs> All right. Uh, any further discussion on that? All right. I will take a roll call vote. Justin? Justin McCarthy, yes. Timlin? Timlin Rossi is yes. Brad? Brad Austin, yes. Matt? Matt Hunt, yes. And Mike Fontella votes yes as well. Uh, before we move on, I do see one hand up, Dorothy. Yes. Eileen, please state your name. Your street and your question, please. Hi, it's Eileen Wiedegartner, Maplehurst Road. I just have a question about with 60% participation rates in the pool testing, has the district done anything to find out like why parents who are sending their kids to school wouldn't be interested? Like where the hesitant, find out where the hesitancy is and why parents wouldn't want to do that. Um, time. I'm having trouble oh, as a parent sending my child to school. I'm having trouble yeah, wrapping my head around why I wouldn't want to advocate for that. 51 days into his presidency. And has the district tried to figure out a way that why parents aren't doing it and how we can offer PSAs that may change minds. This is a very American thing to do. We spoke at the front. Do you have any thoughts on any of the feedback you've gotten? that card out of his jacket. Did you say Lynn? I, I yes, I did. Oh, okay. <laughs> um, yeah, there's been some there's been some feedback shared uh, at the parent forum. I think some of the younger ones a little bit nervous. Um, I think that their comfort has increased, uh, and we've seen an increase in the consents. Um, but be, beyond that, I think it's a, a personal decision and a choice. Um, uh, you know, I think it's it's definitely, I can just say it's very important for us to get to that 80% for the data to be meaningful and for it to continue so that the data is useful. Um, and uh, as far as, as PSAs, that's something that we would be ha happy to do and share out. And uh, But I would definitely um, put that out to the the school committee who are parents <laughs> to see if they have any any kind of anecdotal feedback as far as why there's there might be hesitation to pa to participate. All right. And I know that when we talked about introducing the program, uh, a lot of people were struggling with the the what happens if you're in a positive pool? How soon can you get the antigen test? People were worried that their children were going to miss uh, school days. Uh, even though the likelihood would be that they would test negative, but because of the timing, we've tried to assure them that that is not what would happen, that the availability of the second level testing would be before the next time your child was doing school. Although that dynamic might change a little bit because we might be moving away from the Monday, Tuesday, Thursday, Friday type of model. So um, I think maybe as we, uh, make some changes, any potential changes. I think we should frame the testing program around those changes. And I think that would give us an opportunity to reach out again to the community and see what their concerns are and try to ask away to them uh, in an effort to, to get them to participate in the program. I do think that that is a good point and not that I want, a, I certainly don't want a positive pool, but there may be parents that are, are waiting to see um, or to hear how, what happens if a positive pool happens and to see how that goes and to see how efficiently we are able to, to conduct the reflex testing. But what I can say is that I'm very confident um, that I can uh, assure families that we have the system set up and the infrastructure to be able to very efficiently conduct the reflex testing. We've been receiving the results right in, in line with what we have has been promised by the vendor. Um, so we're certainly in good shape with that. All right, great. Thank you. All right. Thank you, Eileen. Thank you. All right. Next on the agenda is a uh, statement of interest on Shaker Lane. Just to add a little context before Steve Mark jumps in here, we have a statement of interest currently filed with the Mass uh, Building Commission. Uh, this 
particular statement of interest is if the current one is not accepted, we're not put on the list, which is entirely possible. It often takes more than one try with uh, this group to get in their, their queue. Uh, and what happens is the, the timelines overlap. So the goal here tonight is to uh, uh, approve a second statement of interest that would be ready and be submitted in case we don't get accepted in the next round. That puts us right into the to the next sequence so we don't miss out on a year uh, to, to restart the process. So Steve, if, if you could just let us know if I misrepresented that at all. Oh, I, uh, no, that was perfect. Uh, you stole my thunder, but thank you. So, that, <laughs> um, so um, we are currently in communication with MSBA. They are uh, reviewing the Shake a Lane project for inclusion possibly this year, but we haven't received that uh, official acceptance or official uh, rejection at this point in time. So this is really, as Mike said, uh, just to, to hedge our bets so we can be in line to submit a statement of interest this year if, we, if, uh, if Shake Lane doesn't make that project. Uh, we did present this, the, the same, and this is the same statement of interest um, that we um, approved and submitted last year. It will be word for word, pretty much the same thing, but we did present uh, the vote to the Board of Selectmen this past Monday night. They did approve it. Uh, this is, again, just for school committee. It has to be approved by both boards. Um, and so tonight is school committee. And then that will set us up for being able to submit, to submit that statement once that process opens. Thank you. All right. Any questions uh, from the school committee? Okay. This does require a motion. And, and uh, you may want to, um, I, I don't know what's, let's, um, the Board of Selectmen read the whole thing. I don't know if you really need the whole thing, but um, at least read the first paragraph of the motion, the having convened in an open meeting section, if somebody can at least read that into the minutes. Um, Dave can share the screen if we need to, if somebody needs to read it. Dave, can you share that screen, please? So if you just scroll down just a little bit. Or that might be up. Scroll up. It should be the first page. Yeah, so if you can just read that first paragraph in the box, it says resolved, having convened in an open meeting on March 11th, please. Yeah. Sure. Resolved, having convened in an open meeting on March 11th, 2021, prior to the SOI submission closing date, the school committee of the town of Littleton, Mass., Littleton Public Schools, in accordance with its charter by laws and ordinances, has voted to authorize the superintendent to submit to the Massachusetts School Building Authority, the statement of interest form that will be submitted to the MSBA by no later than Friday, April 30th, 2021, for the Shaker Lane School, located at 35 Shaker Lane, Littleton, Mass., which describes and explains the following deficiencies and the priority category categories for which an application may be submitted to the Massachusetts School Building Authority in the future for MSBA application priorities as described below. Wow, Adam DeCoast, I hope he didn't close auditions yet. He would have found his next Romeo right there. I tell you what. <laughs> All right, so that was a, uh, a motion. Can I get a second? We can second. Se second on that. All right, any further discussion on the motion? No, Hearing none. Matt does have an excellent TV voice, I guess. I didn't, I, I re, voice for radio, I didn't realize. Uh, yeah. that. I, I have a face for TV. I mean, I have a face for radio, they say, right? That's right. Well, somebody will buy what he's selling. All right, we'll take a roll call vote. Justin? Justin McCarthy, yes. Timlin? Timlin Rossi is yes. Brad? Brad Austin, yes. Matt? Matt Hunt, yes. All right, Mike Fontella votes yes as well. All right, thank you, Steve. Make sure that gets out on time. Yep, thank you, and I'll keep everybody, as soon as we hear from anything from MSBA, I will let everybody know. Thank Do you. Do we know roughly what, what, what their timeline is for the current cycle? Uh, not off the top of my head. I don't remember. I know they're in reviewing, and they're reviewing all of the current applications. Okay. They ask us, and Michelle uh, Kane 
was um, very generous enough. She made a, a video uh, montage of the school and some of the issues that we see <laughs> uh, and they're reviewing that um, as we speak, I think. So I, I think it's just a matter of uh, being patient and letting them work through that process. And I don't remember what that timeline is. Okay. Brad? Like if funded, do you know if they could start working on that this summer? Is that No. So what happens is if they approve it, that's just the first step. And then that puts us into a, uh, we would do a study, feasibility study. So we're even if we get approval by the MSBA, we're, we're another year at least away from breaking ground. Um, but, you know, the sooner we get into their queue, uh, and it's typically Russell Street was, Steve, was that over 50% or just below 50% reimbursement on that project? I, I, I seem to remember that was about 46 or 47% right. reimbursement, but that was 10 years ago. Right. Um, so the, the, the value of getting in their queue is is getting that reimbursement. You get like a certain per, a significant percentage of the project cost is borne by the state and not by the taxpayers of Littleton. Uh, so it's really worthwhile. Um, there are, you know, but once you're in there, you got to go through their process, right? Because it's now it's there, there at the table with you. Um, it's, but it's good. It's been, it was a great pro uh, process with, with Russell street came out great. Um, so it would be exciting to get the approval because that would definitely give us a head of steam on getting this done and the likelihood of getting approval from town meeting and the voters would obviously be enhanced by virtue of the fact that, we were being reimbursed for, you know, whatever percentage instead of footing the whole bill ourselves. Uh, so that's the goal. So, yeah, stay tuned. Long way to go. Right. Uh, Mike, could I just say one more, one more other little project update uh, yep. just to let everybody know um, the, and, and you were on the, the call. I just want to mention that the septic project at the high school field uh, is going out to bid and that project will happen over the summer, uh, late summer, early fall. And so uh, the high school fields will be uh, offline at some point in time and we'll keep everybody in that loop. I just wanted to mention it here. Thank you. Yep. Thank you. All right, moving on. We're going to talk about the mo data from the most recent family survey. I believe Beth Steele is going to lead out on this. Yes. And I feel the pressure is on with the um, amazing presentations tonight, <laughs> just starting with Sammy um, and Ambie, and then apparently with a potential new Romeo. Uh, I mean, uh, pressure, pressure's there. So um, happy to present the results from the latest family survey that was completed last week. Um, so we do have slides. If Dave, you could share the screen, that would be great. Thank you so much. So um, to provide some background on the next slide, <clears throat> The survey was sent out Monday, March 1st. It closed on Monday, March 8th. The purpose was to gather input and the comfort levels of, of families with the physical distancing and the desire to either go full in person or to go full remote. All in all, we had 1,188 responses on this nine question survey. On the next slide, <laughs> we have the response breakdown of um, the responses, the total responses that we get, we received on this survey. So when we're talking about the schools, it's important to note that these responses, we didn't get 100% responses from any of the schools. So when we talk about, when we break down into the school level, it's important to note that when I say Russell Street School responses, um, we're talking about 82% of the population at Russell Street School because that's the amount of responses that we got from Russell Street School. Um, so we can see here the, the breakdown at Shaker Lane, we received 294 responses, which is about 79%. And then on the right side, you can see grade by grade, we broke down um, at each grade level, how many responses we received and what the percentage of that grade level is. <clears throat> At Russell Street, we received a total of 305 responses, and that was 82% of Russell Street's population. At the middle school, we received 297 responses, which is 77% of that population. And at the high school, we received 292 responses, which is 67% of that population. On the next slide, we have question number five, but before we actually dive into question number five, um, just to remind folks, what were questions one through four? Um, so question one, we asked what your name was. Question two, we asked what your child's name was. 
Question three, we asked for your child's grade. Question four, we asked what the current learning model of your child was. And then question five, we started to get into the meat of the survey. And so for question number five, we were really um, asking, getting into the comfort level of physical distancing. And so there were four options provided, the first of which um, was to have, have physical distancing with no less than six feet. Um, so keeping that six feet, which is where we are currently at at the moment. Um, option two was to maximize the capacity of in-person learning with between three to six feet of physical distancing. Option three was to maximize the capacity of in-person learning with no minimum physical distancing. And then option four was that you would not be comfortable with any of the other three options that were presented. So when we look at the responses here, um, we'll start with option one, which was keep it at six feet, do not go underneath. Um, about 25.5% of our respondents chose this one. That, that equates to 303 responses. For option two, again, that's the three to six feet. 456 responses equates to about 38%. Option three, which was no minimum um, on the physical distancing, is 283 responses at about 24%. And then lastly, option four, again, of the I'm not comfortable with any of these options, was uh, we received 146 responses at about 12%. So when we look at this in total, um, we can see that about 62.6% are okay um, with going back with no minimum of physical distancing or a three to six physical distancing minimum. <clears throat> On the next slide, we dive deeper into school by school responses of question number five. So we're still on question number five. In the, on the right pie chart, you see the school response. And then on the left, it's broken down by grade level. <clears throat> so the pie charts here are, are for the visual sake of being able to see. The actual numbers are in a, later, a couple of later slides. Um, so we'll skim over them when we get to those, but these are just for the, the sake of having that visual for you. So when we look at um, the pie chart here, we have three colors as opposed to four. And the reason for that is that we ended up combining options two and three for these slides. Remember that options two and three were the I'm comfortable with going three to six feet or with um, no minimum physical distancing. And so we, for the sake of these next couple slides, we combined those into one option. So for Shaker Lane, um, in order uh, to just go through these numbers as a school level, those that chose to have a minimum of six feet, keeping it where it was, was about 19%, and that's 55 respondents from Shaker Lane. For options two and three combined, we had 205 responses, um, which equates to about 70%. And then for the, those that were not comfortable at all, about 12% with 34 responses. Now this is where it's important to remember that the response rate for Shaker Lane as a school as a whole was 79%. So when we're looking at this pie chart, this represents 79% of the population at Shaker Lane. On the next slide, we have uh, what will look very similar, but for Russell Street, so when we're looking at Russell Street's numbers, we see that 71 respond, uh, of the respondents or 23% would like to keep the minimum six foot distancing, uh, whereas about 63% or 191 responses are okay with either no minimum or the three to six foot minimum, leaving 14%, which is 43 respondents, not comfortable with any of the choices. Um, again, the left side, those three pie charts are grade three, four, five, um, showing the individual grade responses for that. And again, at Russell Street, this represents 82% of the Russell Street um, population. On the next slide, we have the middle school. So here, when we look at this, 27% or 81 respondents would like to keep the minimum of six foot distancing, uh, 180 80 respondents or 61% would like to um, combine those options two, three, so uh, six or less, anything down to, to no minimum. And then 12% or 36 respondents were not comfortable with any of the options. Again, um, the left side is grade six, seven, eight. 
And then this for the middle school represents 77% of the population because that's the response rate that we received from the middle school. And on the next slide, we have the responses for the high school. So we can see here that 33% of the high school respondents um, would like to keep the minimum of six foot physical distancing. And that equates to 96 responses. Whereas 56% uh, or 163 responses are comfortable with the three to six or no minimum. Uh, while 11%, which equates to 33 responses, are not comfortable with any of the options that were provided. Again, left side, we have grades 9, 10, 11, and 12. And important to remember that at the school right here, we had six, a 67% response rate, so it's representative of 60% of the population at the high school. The next two slides, <clears throat> so we can just go to the next one first, Dave. Thank you so much. Um, so the numbers that you're gonna see here are, are the actual raw data numbers um, that we saw in the pie charts in the previous slides. Perfect, thank you. So these, these are the actual numbers that go with the pie charts that you just saw. <clears throat> um, they're here for, for your reference, um, the raw number plus the percentage. So if we can go to the next slide, please. Again, same thing, the raw numbers for the middle school and high school pie charts there for your reference. Next slide, please. So still in question number five, we really are, are digging in here. Um, this, uh, a, a similar, um, a different way to look at the, at the same question. So here we're breaking down by school, we're breaking it down by option. And then we combined out this, the options two and three. So people that are comfortable with no minimum or people that are comfortable with the three to six minimum. So when we're looking at these and we look at Shaker Lane and Russell Street together, our elementary schools, we can see that 66% are comfortable with um, no minimum or a three to foot, six foot minimum. Again, we need to remember it's not 100% of the population that responded. Um, so we need to just keep that in mind. The um, Littleton Middle School, 61% um, were comfortable with no minimum or the three to six foot minimum. And at the high school, 56% are comfortable with no minimum or the three to six percent, um, three to six foot minimum. The next slide, please. Now we're gonna move on to question number six. So number six really asked about in-person in learning versus remote. And so if as a district, um, we are going to offer the fully in-person learning model option and the fully remote learning model option, which would your child participate? Um, so you can see on the pie chart that 25, about 25% 25 uh, equates to 294 respondents chose that their child would participate in the remote learning model. Whereas about 75% or 894 respondents chose that they would like to participate in the in-person learning model, which it would be the five full days a week. Now, it's really important to note on this, um, this question in particular, that while these numbers are really helpful and they provide us guidance, we need to take them with a little bit of a grain of salt um, because the expectations of what will full in-person learning look like have not been fully um, clear or decided upon for families. So for example, what I'm referencing here is physical distancing, right? So families may have filled this out thinking that, well, the full five day in person is gonna be six feet, so yes, I'm gonna send my child. If they learn um, because of a, a decision that is made or a change that is made that all of a sudden that six foot physical distancing minimum is being brought down to three to six feet or to no um, distancing, then that may change their mind. And so what was previously a response for in-person learning may very well change to the remote learning side, depending on decisions that are, uh, are made and discussed this evening. So I just want to point that out that while this number is helpful and provides us some guidance, uh, we need to be careful with what the, these numbers are actually saying and know that they may change based on conversations and decisions that are had this evening. On the next slide, we'll dig into number six a little bit more. Again, we're taking this with a grain of salt. Um, so if we look at this slide, just to, to explain the slide, first of all, we have it broken down by school. So if we look at Shaker Lane specifically, 
For Shaker Lane, we're saying that there's 239 in person and 55 remote. Those numbers are based on the survey results. So 239 responses were that they would like to go in person. 55 responses were that they would like to go remote. So that's based on um, the, the survey responses that people submitted. What's what we need to look at here is the switch between remote to in-person and then hybrid to remote. So people that are choosing to change their learning style. Um, and again, this is where those numbers might change on us given any decisions that are made tonight. So as of right now, based on the responses that we received, we currently have 20 students who right now are remote at Shaker Lane and their, their families, their students, would like to change learning models to be from remote to go to the in-person learning model. And then vice versa, we have five students at Jaker Lane who are currently in the hybrid learning model and they would like to go remote. So we're able to see those numbers for all of four schools here. <clears throat> so at Russell Street, we're able to see um, that breakdown of who wants to go in person versus who wants to go remote. And then also that switch in school as a school total, 24 are, are um, remote, but they wanna go in person and then five vice versa. And so we have the numbers on the bottom for middle school and high school as well. So on the next slide, thank you. Um, we're, we're digging further into, into number six. So our last slide was school-based, right? So we were able to see at, at, the, at the school level, the amount of people that um, gave us their indication of which learning model they would like. And then also if they were switching learning models here in this chart, we're able to see grade breakdown of where those switches are happening. Um, and so you can see the grade level is on the, on the far left side. And then when we're talking hybrid to in-person, so for example, we will look at, um, let's look at grade five, which is the very last um, row in this, in this chart. So if we're looking at grade five, we have um, the hybrid to in-person column, which is that second column in, there are 62 respondents who said that they are currently in the hybrid learning model and they chose on the survey that they would go into the in-person learning model. The next column is hybrid to remote so that those respondents are starting in the hybrid learning model and their, their choice would be to go into the remote learning model. The third column is the remote to in-person so they are starting right now they're in a remote learning model and they would like to switch to the in-person learning model. And then the last column is the remote model. They're in the remote model and they want to stay in that remote model for the remainder of the school year. So when we're looking at this chart, our two middle columns that have numbers are that's where our transitions um, and requests to change learning models are happening, which is why we are seeing uh, slightly um, smaller numbers in those columns there. So this is the breakdown uh, by grade for Shaker Lane and for Russell Street. And the next slide has the same breakdown, um, but for grades six to 12 and 12 plus. So for the middle school and high school, same setup for the chart. Um, so you can see the two middle columns with numbers are really where our students are thinking of making those changes or families are thinking of making those changes for those students. Thank you. On the next slide here, <clears throat> we're gonna jump to question number seven. Um, so question number seven, we uh, asked about mitigation strategies um, and, and the ones that are currently being implemented in the school. And so we want to acknowledge that all the mitigation strategies are important um, and, and we view them all as very important. As um, we have seen from Katrina many times over and over is the Swiss cheese model, right? And so all of these mitigation strategies are what is, is building that Swiss cheese model for us. Um, and so it's, it's helpful to have that visual reminder of what our mitigation strategies are and what they look like. When we see this data all together, it is also interesting to see that the top two um, most highly selected responses are number one, clear by clear and far, is mask wearing for all staff and students. And then secondly, is hand hygiene, so hand washing, hand sanitizing. <clears throat> On the next slide, 
Uh, for question number eight, we asked about bus transportation as to whether um, if we shift models, um, what will you need to rely on a bus? And you can see from the numbers that almost 60%, which equates to 707 responses, said no, they do not need the bus. Uh, whereas 41%, which equates to 481 responses, would need the bus. And then on the next slide, we have um, the last question, which is question number nine. In this question, it was the only one that was not mandatory. And we asked um, just any comments, considerations that anyone had. And so we had um, a, a lot of comments. We had 31 pages of comments that were shared with us. And those comments were then passed on and shared with school committee members as well as the admin team. So everyone could read those comments um, and see what everyone was saying. It, after reading the comments and considerations, we thought this might be a good time to just have the principals update very briefly on the specific strategy, mitigation strategies that are happening at each school. Um, so we're going to start with Shaker Lane and we'll just go up from there. Again, we're just going to share the brief mitigation strategies that are e at each school. So um, Principal Kane, would you mind starting us off? Thank you, Beth. So a lot of them, um, Mrs. Steele has already shared with you. Um, I'll just go through a few other ones in a random order. So pool testing, face masks, unless medically um, unable to use them, six feet of distance everywhere in the building, cafeteria, classrooms, hallways, tabletop barriers for shields when teachers are working with students as an additional mitigation strategy. All desks are facing forward. We have seen sanitizers at the entry of every at the entrance of every building, um, as well as in the classroom. The kids hand sanitized before eating, after eating. The lunchroom had six feet of distance, um, and then beyond six feet between two cohorts that we have in the lunchroom. And our hallway traffic, we have six foot shakies. So at, when kids stop in the hallway, they know what they have to. The tag word this year is find a shaky. So they jump on a shaky. So those are our mitigation strategies. Thanks, Michelle. We'll go to Cheryl. Yes. Um, it's funny on my list, I forgot to put masks. Isn't that funny? We're just so used to them at this point. Um, masks, obviously, by all um, students and staff. We have a separate entrance at Russell Street for each grade level. Um, we have a sanitizing station at each one of the entrances and also throughout the building. There's a, an adult at each entrance. Um, there's a stop sign in the morning um, saying to stop there if you're not feeling well so students can speak to the adult and go through their the checklist. Um, that happens every, every day if anyone stops there. We have um, not shaky prints, but we have painted um, footprints for proper spacing um, and dots out on the pavement um, for proper spacing coming in from recess. Um, we use only, um, we have signs on the restroom doors that only two students um, can be in the restroom at a time. We deliver lunches to the classroom. So students eat um, in their classrooms at their desks. Recess areas are separate per um, class. We have air purifiers in all the classrooms and learning spaces, um, regular cleaning and sanitizing. Um, we have the ability, um, students have the ability to log on and learn remotely on days that they are not feeling well. And we also have the pool. Thank you, Cheryl. Jason? Yeah, we um, practice many of the same protocols that, that have already been mentioned. So I'll, I'll skip over those, you know, things that are specific to the middle school. Uh, we also have um, separate entrances for six, seven, and eight. Although this fall, we did combine the six and seven entrance just because the weather got so cold, we couldn't have the seventh grader standing outside at some zero temperature, but the cafeteria was able to hold those. So for students who arrived before 7.05, um, eighth graders wait in the gym, evenly spaced, um, sixth and seventh grade wait in the cafeteria, also spaced uh, at least six feet apart. We have plenty of hand sanitizers and signage and, and floor markers. Um, we staggered the schedule to minimize the congestion in the hallways in, in common areas like stairwells, um, the lobby areas between, between wings. Um, we, you know, we, we've limited outsiders from coming into the building unless they have, um, you know, specific reason, but if parents, you know, dropping off or picking up, we ask them to, to leave things outside. And then one of our personnel goes to get it so that we just minimize the, the foot traffic from outside, um, you know, cleaning of desks, um, you know, in addition to, um, you know, everything else that we're doing, you know, desk washing and, and, and having as many virtual meetings as possible. So we've, we've been able to maintain the, the, the very same protocols that we started the year with. Awesome. Thanks, Jason. John for the high school. 
Yep. Uh, so I get the, the, the good fortune of listen, you've listened to everybody else. So all, pretty much all of the above of what everyone else has mentioned. Some things like Jason had pointed out that are unique, perhaps the high school. Um, and this may be actually happening at some of the other schools. Is the, we're using more QR codes instead of having sign in, sign out procedures to limit, you know, sharing of pens and other things like that. Uh, there was a lot of attention at the beginning of all this to surfaces. And now we know we really have to emphasize the mass and the spacing to the extent we can, but particularly the mass. Um, so plexiglass is available in various classrooms for teachers who requested it. We have um, uh, distancing uh, in the lunchroom in the cafeteria with plexiglass dividers between students. Um, we also have the wiping of the tables after each lunch. We have three lunches. Uh, so everything is thoroughly you know, wiped down uh, before the next set of students come in to eat lunch. Um, again, people have already mentioned uh, the, the, this, the preponderance of uh, hand sanitizer and emphasis on hand washing, limits to the restrooms on how many students can be in there. The air purifiers have been a wonderful addition there throughout the building in all the spaces um, and in classrooms and meeting rooms. Um, so that's been, that's been really great. Um, and I think it, oh, the other thing that we, I think Jason mentioned, it was the adjustment to our schedule. We had a, we created a special schedule at the beginning of the year and uh, with less classes and that's minimized uh, or reduced our num number of class transitions, number of people in the hall throughout the, throughout the day. Um, but it, I think everybody else kind of covered everything. In particular, the signage has helped to, to be visual reminders throughout the building of, you know, keeping your spacing, making sure that you're wearing a face covering. Um, that kind of thing. Happy to answer any questions. Or if I miss something, uh, you know, I'm happy to be reminded of it. Thanks, John. So the just to wrap up the family survey, um, just want to give a big shout out to the families who responded to the survey. Again, we had 1,188 responses, which was wonderful. It's really helpful for us um, to go through to read while, you know, we we're all over the, the spectrum of where opinions lie. Um, it's really helpful to have those voices heard. So thank you to everyone who responded um, to the survey. Uh, Beth, can I just say one thing on that? Um, uh, just on the on the safety protocols, uh, we are also extending those onto the buses as well. So there's they're disinfecting the buses. There are hand sanitizer uh, stations on the bus for the students as they enter those buses. So we're we're following those protocols on the buses um, as well, and working with our bus company on that. I just want to remind everybody that that's going on there as well. Thank you. Yeah. I'd just like to add too, while uh, we're on that, that vein, Cheryl mentioned it, but in all the schools, we, we brought the HEPA filters in, in the, uh, in November and December. Uh, we talked a lot in the early part in, in August and September about our HVAC systems, which are outstanding. They're in great shape. We made upgrades to filtration. Um, so we were already in really good shape. But adding those HEPA filters just took us right over the top. Um, nobody should have any concerns about the air quality, even when the windows are closed. Uh, you know, we're not hospital grade, but we're way above your grocery stores and, and your restaurants and everybody, uh, any other, uh, you know, public gathering place that you would typically be in beyond a hospital uh, or a factory with, with clean, clean rooms. Um, so that's important to keep in mind, too. So thank you for, for all of that. Um, at this point, I would like to ask the school committee if they have comments, questions uh, on what we just heard. Uh, Chairman Fontanella, could I? Oh, yeah, go ahead, Dr. Clinchy. Yep, sorry. Yep. Thank you. Sorry, sorry, D Kelly, do you have something? Uh, oh, I'm sorry. Yes, I have one more slide that I wanted to go oh, over. Oh, yeah, go ahead. Uh, yep. Deliberating. Get it up. Okay. And, uh, Dorothy, could you load that or mm -hmm. TV? We didn't hear you say it the first time. <laughs> I'm sorry. Be too quiet tonight. <laughs> Thank you. So, folks, this slide uh, just gives us an indication of, of what physical distancing uh, would be like in our K to five classrooms with our students who are currently hybrid. Uh, we have full hybrid return. So we have the number of students that we, we currently have. And, and you can see there at Shaker Lane, we, we have a physical distancing of approximately five feet in, in most classrooms, a couple with five and a half feet. Uh, we go to Russell Street School, 
uh, five and a half feet uh, for most of them. Grade three, we have to five feet uh, physical distancing and some sixes as well as you, you go down the list of, of classrooms. I think it's important to note that pre-COVID, the way teachers set up their classrooms and the space that they need to teach is, is typically around six feet of distance. Uh, you know, depending on the classroom, uh, there's also maybe 15, 20 feet of, of, of vertical distance, so to speak. Uh, and, the, and the six feet is, is indicative of uh, the closest student uh, to the front of the room. So I just wanted to, to put that out there as well. So I want to make sure that everybody understands that this is, this is based on our current hybrid numbers. Uh, the commissioner uh, on the Board of Education uh, passed a motion that uh, certainly uh, is going to change that. And you, you've seen somewhat of an indication tonight in the last presentation that some, some families are going to choose to move uh, their, their children from uh, full remote to full in person. So these numbers are gonna fluctuate a bit. There'll be some families that uh, perhaps are going to move their, their uh, children from uh, hybrid to remote. So I want, I want you to, to be cognizant of the fact that, that these numbers are, are, are not firm or static at this point in time. But it does give you an idea. Uh, Mike, I, I think you wanna have a deliberation before we, we go into the new regulations, but I just have to- right. Right. Yeah, Thank you. Yeah, I appreciate that. Yeah, I, I would like to ask uh, school committee if they have any comments or questions on the survey information that we just saw. Brad, go ahead. Yeah, thanks, Beth, for that. And thanks for everyone who helped, um, including the parents filling out. This is really useful. I understand it's a snapshot. It's not a commitment. But um, looking at the numbers, especially at the lower elementary the grade um, the total of coming in per grade who are anticipating they might want to come in for remote in person um, helps me think about those numbers that Kelly just showed. I wonder though, um, as we look at these numbers, which give us a snapshot of though at 1100 something who filled it out, um, there was always a pretty consistent, I was trying to take notes, 12, 14% who weren't going to be comfortable in any measure. Um, I'm guessing those are probably the families who already have children in full mode and would probably want to stay there. That may not be a safe assumption, but it, it might be. Um, have we, did you ever try to run the numbers where it was, the, what the preferences were for those who are already in person? And does that, does that skew things in any direction? Does that make sense? I think, I think it does. Let me provide an answer and you can tell me whether I understood your question or not. Mm -hmm. um, so the, the, those that were in person were able to respond to this survey as well and be able to say whether they wanted to go in person, maintain their in person, but extend it to the full five days. Um, am I, am I hitting your, where you're asking? I asked the question really poorly. I guess what I'm wondering is coming back to question number five, I believe it was where it was, you know, where do you feel safe? And it was only six feet or greater. It was between six and three. It was, I don't care about a minimum and I'm not gonna feel safe at all. I was wondering if those numbers, if we pulled out those whose children are already in remote, um, they're in there. So again, consistent 12, 14% um, saying they're not gonna be safe in any measure. Um, if we're getting, trying to get a sense of what what families who will, who are likely to send their children into the schools, what their tolerance and what their preference is. I wonder if it's useful to look at those numbers with the, the remote and going to stay remote numbers um, pulled out. Is that, and maybe it's not useful at all, but, I, but, but it seems to me that there's a significant percentage. So if we're getting, um, according to my the numbers, 56 to 70% saying, hey, between three and six is okay. Um, that number might might go up considerably, that percentage might go up percent, um, considerably if we take out those who just don't think it's gonna be safe or be a good option for them and their families um, this year at all. Yeah, I don't think we broke it down at that in that way, but we can certainly, I mean, we have the, we have the data, we can look at it. I'm not asking you more things. I just didn't know if you, if you had looked at it that way. Thank you. I did, I did that, I did that. <laughs> what would you see? So, because, I do this for a living, so sometimes I just, when I'm bored, I do more of it. Uh, so if we, I can, I can send this to you guys. 
if if we uh, take if we just take question six with just the people that are already hybrid learners or indicated on the survey that they're hybrid learners and, and look at the four categories uh, at Shaker Lane, 13 percent uh, would still want to stay at six feet. Uh, 1.8 percent would not be comfortable at any distance and 85 percent would choose either three to six feet or no minimum. Uh, at Russell Street, 19 percent would want to stay at six feet. Zero percent were, were answered uh, not comfortable at any distance and 81 percent would be comfortable at either three to six feet or no minimum. At the middle school, 22 percent are comfortable at six feet. 3% were not comfortable at all, and 74% were comfortable either six feet, uh, three to six feet or no minimum. And at the high school, 31% were comfortable at max with six feet, 2.5% were not comfortable at all, and 67% would be comfortable at three to six feet or no minimum. So it does change the numbers. It goes up into the, you know, the 80s and, or, or 70s when you back out the full remote learners uh, from that, from that, that question. Thank you, Mike. Mike, where'd you get that idea? <laughs> I don't know. I just thought about it. I said, okay. you know, yeah. what would that mean? So yeah. Brad had the same question as me. So yeah, I would say his mind and I work together and that should make everybody uncomfortable. Totally. Um, all right. If I hop in on it, just a quick yeah, comment. Um, so yeah, we asked for the survey two weeks ago and then of course, eight days later, um, sort of the dynamics changed a little bit. I, the survey is still very valuable, uh, in my opinion, and I appreciated everyone filling it out. We got a sense for, you know, where people want it to be. And if you're whatever, if you're an under six foot person or an over six foot person, it's, it's okay to be in either camp because Riley came out and said that we're going to move to full in person and we're also going to offer remote. So, you know, being either place is fine. Um, what was really helpful was um, the 31 pages of, <laughs> of comments. Um, some people, I think, like a half page single spaced, um, and no joke. So this has not been a typical year. I would think maybe it's uh, a typical practice should become like a survey once or twice a year where you just have to ask that open-ended question with, is there anything you want to tell us? Um, because people really did put a lot of time and effort into those comments and we, we read them as fast as we could. We'll get through them all. Um, but, uh, but I found that helpful. So I just wanted to thank all the parents for taking the time to do that in terms of sort of combining Brad's, you know, what does five really mean? And Mike, after you filter it, it becomes maybe a little more meaningful, but Beth's breakdown, uh, further breakdown by grade level with question six is, you know, what kind of student are you now and what kind of student, what's your preferred learning model going forward? You're kind of able to take those two questions and infer that we're going to have some change. Um, and I think that that's, that's okay. We'll, we'll deal with the change. And the resounding comment uh, in the survey was that, the families really like their teachers and they want to keep their teachers uh, if at all possible. Um, and I think that's uh, a statement as to the quality of staff that we have and how happy our families have been. So I think that at this point, you know, other members of course can talk, but I think it's at this point in time appropriate to move on to the next topic where we're going to talk about what we're doing and how we're going to do it and uh, what we need to be thinking about. Yep. Matter Timlin. I have nothing more to add. Mm -hmm. uh, Justin and what's the other guy? <laughs> oh, Brad. Yeah, they, they did a great job. So I yeah. totally agree with them. Uh, I just want to add that, uh, you know, I think the, the level of response, I thank everybody, uh, you know, close to 1,200 out of 1,600 more or less students is a really good sample size in uh, – you know, I appreciate Beth reminding us throughout the presentation that it wasn't everybody, and that's definitely important to keep in mind. On the other hand, you know, the sample sizes, it definitely means that to me that these responses are, you know, reasonably to highly predictive of what the rest of the people would have answered had they, you know, chosen to fill it out. Um, it's not entirely predictive, but it's, it's reasonably to highly, I would think. But she also made another great comment 
you know, you have to be careful about what context people are answering the questions in. And we can't really know. Um, so we definitely got to be, you know, taking that and, and keeping that in the back of our heads when we look at this and not letting it inform us altogether. Uh, I think it's worthwhile to think about it, but uh, we just got to keep those things in mind. So I appreciate the uh, quick turnaround uh, that Beth and I think Lynn helped her out a little bit too. Uh, it was very meaningful. And again, appreciate everybody who did participate in the survey. That helps us a lot. Uh, I do uh, we'll get ready to move on, but I think I see one hand up. So why don't we go ahead and, and do. listen to that. Eileen, please state your name, your street, and your uh, name, please. Eileen Weedy Gartner, Maplehurst Road. Um, I had a question, and I, one, I want to say I appreciate the survey and what everyone did and everyone looking into it. And just to kind of bounce off of what um, Justin McCarthy had said about parents so you guys did the survey it's great and then Riley comes out and says everyone's going back to school or you're going to stay home and as a parent I want to know like my, my most pressing question is what does that mean for my child my daughter is in fifth grade and is in a fully remote class and while I'd love her to go back at the trimester I think Miss Temple knows I decided to keep her home because it was important for her she loves her class she loves her teacher and that was more important than her being in school but now is she going to have to if she goes back is she going to have a shift in teacher are they going to force all the kids to go like I I don't know what that's going to look like for her in the fifth grade and then when we come to the middle school how does it look like for kids who uh, maybe hybrid now can they stay hybrid or are you going to have to be fully remote or go full-time and are there going to be a bunch of shifts in what classes students are in because of that I know when my son went from remote to hybrid some of his classes shifted so I'm just trying to figure out like how much how much change as a parent I'm going to have to manage for 65 days of school right yeah, we're, we're definitely going to address that in our uh, in the next agenda item. So I think I'd rather than try to answer all of that. We'll go through that discussion and hopefully uh, we will we will address some of those concerns or questions. And if we don't, um, we'll we'll circle back to your specific uh, questions, Eileen. Um, Thank you. I would just say that. Uh, we're going to have a robust discussion, but I want to make sure everybody understands we're not going to solve every problem or be able to answer every question. A lot of the questions that are going to be asked in that specific regard are going to require some time by the administration to, uh, you know, do some work on it and some, some thinking and, and being creative. And it's also going to require, and we'll get to this too, that this was a survey and the context wasn't necessarily there. The context is definitely going to get fleshed out tonight and in, you know, the next week or two. So people are going to be asked again with more information and, and questions answered. What do you want to do? And we're going to be able to explain, you know, answer A will, will potentially mean this and answer B would potentially mean this. And then that should help people make a, a more informed decision. Uh, and then ha once we get that input and feedback, we'll be able to task the administration with uh, helping us understand what that means to them in terms of the makeup of classrooms and the delivery of curriculum and, and things like that. More, more questions? Yeah, sure, go ahead. Okay. Kara Whitaker, please state your name in your street and your question, please. Hi, this is Carla Whitaker. Um, I live at 67 Hartwell Avenue. Um, my question is just regarding question five of the survey and the, and the presentation regarding the spacing. I was wondering why the two questions of three to six feet and comfortable with no minimum were presented, were um, combined for the presentation as someone who chose three to six as something I was comfortable with. I certainly wouldn't have chosen zero minimum. So I was just wondering um, if someone could explain why those two are lumped together in the presentation. Thank you. Beth, you want to take a stab at that? Sure, so we combined them um, on, when we got down to the, the school and the grade level because those that were comfortable with uh, no minimum, we knew were then also comfortable with that three to six foot minimum. 
Um, so we chose for the purpose of when we got down to the nitty gritty breaking down to combine them. Um, however, when you go to the further slide, so they're combined on the pie charts, but when you go um, past the pie charts, uh, there are the charts, those options two and three are separated out in the uh, raw data. So the numbers are there for you. Um, we just chose for the, the pie charts visually to reduce it to three options as opposed to the four. Thank you. All right, thank, thank you, Beth. You. Wendy Rosenblum, please state your name, your street and your question, please. Hi, my name is Wendy Rosenblum Isaac, 79 Neshoba Road. Um, I wanted to start very briefly and say thank you for um, spending so much time at the beginning to kind of showcase the kids and the wonderful stuff that's happening. I think a lot of that's gotten lost this year. So thank you for doing that. Um, and just a clarifying question. I, am I understanding correctly that if the hybrid kids both came back across cohorts, we're looking at on average a six inch difference in the distancing? Uh, yes, with the, the current students who are, who are in the hybrid model, that, that's right. Depending on the classroom and, and the school, uh, mostly five feet of distance, uh, Shaker Lane, uh, where it's mostly five and a half feet at, at Russell Street. Okay, as a parent, that's very heartening because I think there's been a lot of concern about, you know, that there's certainly been a lot of posts and a lot of speculation that three feet, you've got kids sitting on top of each other and, you know, what have you, and six inches is very benchmark. So I appreciate you sharing that so transparently. Thank you. Thank you, Wendy. No more questions. Okay. All right. So uh, the next topic on the agenda is the discussion about what we've been kind of talking around, which is the uh, Massachusetts Board of Elementary and Secondary Education, which is Bessie. It's not a cow, but nonetheless, uh, it came out with uh, Commissioner Riley petitioned them for authority uh, to do some things and I'm gonna ask Dr. Clenchy to kind of summarize what those things are and uh, what that might mean. And then we can talk about it as a school committee uh, and then we'll see if there's any public input after that. Uh, thank you. Never thought of Bessie as a name of a cow before, but uh, really interesting perspective, yes. <laughs> uh, the landscape has really changed in the last two weeks. And when we started to get, gather data, we, we had an inkling that it may change, but we had to gather data in a, in a format that uh, gave us the greatest amount of flexibility until we, we knew whether or not the state was uh, going to uh, make a motion on, on March 5th to give the Commissioner of Education the authority to uh, determine uh, what schools and districts will do in, in terms of offering full five-day in-person learning. Uh, with, within the, the recommendation that was approved, uh, they also supported the continuation of remote learning until the end of the year. Uh, hybrid learning, uh, we were increasing the terminology as we, we go on throughout the year, but the, the opportunity to go one or two days a week in person and, and then remote uh, is gone. And, and we have until April 5th for K-5 to to transform our our uh, learning models into five day in person or uh, full time remote. So what does this, what does this mean? Uh, it, it, it means that the information that I just talked about will, will be put within a regulatory statute, will be placed in that statute, uh, which becomes law. And uh, we're under an obligation obviously to follow law and it's, it's placed uh, in a section called time on learning. So hybrid models uh, as of uh, April 5th uh, would not count uh, towards time on learning when they're, when they're not in school, which would uh, not be something that we could do because we're required to meet uh, definitive hours of instruction requirements and uh, number of days of, of uh, learning uh, with, within the state framework. So, in that framework, or, or the new regulations more correctly, it stipulates uh, that social distancing or, or physical distancing of three to six feet is acceptable in classrooms. Uh, during lunch periods, uh, they're uh, maintaining six feet of distancing. 
during movement throughout the halls. There, there is no set distancing. They, they just, you know, expect us to stagger movement throughout the halls and, and, and keep our students moving and, and not stopping in a place. And other, you know, that's kind of the Coles Notes version of, of, of what's happened. I can't think of anything else I need to add unless, Mike, you, you would like me to talk about something else uh, at this time. No, I, I think that gets to, to the gist of what happened. But can I ask you, did you say Coles Notes? Yes. That's a, is that a can Canadian thing? Because we call them Cliff Notes down here. Oh, the Coles Notes up in Canada. Yeah, okay, that's what I thought. All right. <laughs> I didn't want people to misunderstand what you were talking the Canadian about. Words, the Canadian words come out. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So, right. That, that is, 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 as I understood it as well, the biggest change is, is that, uh, you know, you, we're required to go down to three to six feet distancing as low as we need to get to get anybody that wants to be in the building uh, on a daily basis. That's what we need to do. We can still offer full remote instruction. Correct me if I'm wrong though. We could offer a remote time of instruction to students who are ostensibly full-time in-person learners if they needed to be out for some reason, if they were quarantining or they or needed to stay home because they were symptomatic on a given day, they would still be allowed to have remote instruction and still qualify for the time on learning. You're muted, Kelly. Sorry, you, you hit the, the switch oh, by accident. There, there, back on. Uh, that's correct. There are two exceptions. Uh, if a student is uh, symptomatic, uh, and they have to stay home. Uh, they they could certainly uh, stay home and and uh, stream into the classroom, and and that would be obviously counted as as uh, acceptable learning time. If students uh, are quarantined uh, because they're close contact, or if they have to isolate because they've contracted COVID nineteen, uh, they could also stay at home remotely and uh, stream into the the classroom, and that would be acceptable. Okay. All right. All right. Um, and then you, you gave us a, a you, that slide that showed what the impact would be of accepting the current hybrid learner or the current volume of, hi, of hybrid learners each day. Instead of splitting them more or less in two, we'd have them all in. Um, have there, you guys had any other time to think about what would the impacts be and, and what would need to be done to plan and, and execute on something like that? Uh, I'll start and then I'm going to turn it over to Principal Kane and, and Principal Tempo. We, we've had, we had a hour and a half meeting the other day to, to take a look at this and it, it's not as, as simple as you can well imagine as just opening the doors and bringing the kids back. Uh, at Shaker Lane there, there's going to have to be uh, some uh, re, uh, rearranging of, of specialty staff to if we bring kindergarten back full day, uh, we would have to use some of those specialty staff, art, music, phys ed staff, uh, and schedule their times for the afternoon for, for kindergarten. Uh, some of the service delivery for our students uh, that require additional services, some of the, the slots may, may also have to be reorganized, and that, that would be true at uh, Russell Street School as well. Lunches really need to be figured out. Do we need to maintain that six feet of distancing? Uh, we, we do have plans or ideas that, that, would, that would make it work. Uh, and, uh, you know, just making sure that, that we have su sufficient furniture in the room, et cetera. I mean, you have to remember, we, we spent a number of years getting rid of traditional seating. And by traditional seating, I mean rows of desks and classrooms. And, and we've developed cooperative learning groups, uh, uh, we've, we've developed alternate seating uh, in our classrooms. And again, that just doesn't work with, with the current situation that we have. So we're, we're uh, finding furniture that we have in storage. Remember, we, we moved a tremendous amount of furniture out prior to the start of the school year. Thank goodness we have warm temperatures and the snow is, snow is melting. So it's gonna be much easier to gain access uh, to those containers. Although there's a lot of stuff in there, it's gonna take time to sift through to get the stuff out that we really need to make this work. And uh, I'm gonna, at this time, uh, ask if Principal Kane has anything else to add in, in terms of Shaker Lane. No, thank you, Dr. Clinch. A lot of that is, is what's on my list. Um, the first thing that is gonna be on my list is compiling the data from the Google Forms and making sure I have a response from every 
family because I know when we did the attestation forms, that was, there was, I would say 50 to 80 parents that did not respond by the deadline. So that's, that's going to take time to reach out to those families, which I will start Tuesday, Wednesday, you know, of next week or whenever we send the survey out, just really trying to get that form in. So that's going to take time. I know Dr. Clinch, you talked about the furniture going out, going in. If we were to bring back any of our remote teachers, those remote classrooms are currently kind of storage rooms. So we'll have to clean those out, find room for that furniture. And if you think of a primary classroom, those teachers are in there for weeks setting up their classroom. And I know we'll only have a couple of weeks left, a couple of months left when the students come back on April 5th, but we still want it to be inviting and warm and a place they want to be. So I need those teachers to have the time to set up those classrooms if those teachers will be bringing kids back into the room. Um, and then Dr. Clenchy mentioned, you know, adding specialists for the kindergarten if they will need, um, the teachers will need their prep time. Um, and then just realigning not only special ed, but reading support, math support to change from um, a model either going in or going out remote. And Principal Temple? Um, thank you. I um, agree with the things that um, that Mrs. Kane said. Um, our biggest challenge, I think, at Russell Street right now is, um, and we did some measuring today, um, is to figure out the cafeteria space. Um, all of our, the spacing for eating has to be six feet. And as you can see from the chart that Dr. Clinchy showed a bit ago, most of our classrooms would not be at six feet. Um, so we're gonna set up some space in the cafeteria and have some students eat in the classroom and some students eat in the calf. Um, I think um, after measuring today that that's um, really um, doable. Um, we will have to look at scheduling for our um, unified arts um, as um, more kids come back to make sure we have correct spacing um, in the gym and for band and things like that. Um, but again, I think that is doable. I think the most important thing, and I agree with Michelle, is um, while the survey um, was to get information for us, the next form is actually a registration form. And so um, if we don't have 100% of the registration forms back, it's going to be difficult to um, plan for the classrooms. Um, so I really do encourage everyone who's listening tonight um, to fill out that registration form when they get it. Um, you know, the, the biggest challenge, if hybrid students come back to school, that we can easily manage. Um, if it, it is um, the possibility of remote students coming back to school, that um, that makes the decision making difficult in, in trying to place students. And I think that's, you know, what really the challenge that we talked about in our meeting the other day. So until we have the data um, on Thursday, um, we won't really know. Um, so again, I encourage people to fill out that form. Thank you. And, and one thing we didn't mention, uh, middle school, the commissioner did uh, pick a date that uh, he would expect uh, middle schools to be uh, offering a five-day full in-person, and that date is April 28th. All right. At this point, I'd ask the school committee if you have questions or input or thoughts about how we're going to direct the administration to proceed. Matt? Uh, yeah, I mean, I think for me, I think one of the things is we have to listen to the parents and do what's right for the kids. I mean, for from my perspective, it's really important to have, if the parents want to have the kids stay with the same teacher that they've had all year, um, that creates the scenario where a lot of these teachers who have five full day in-person students are going to remain uh, doing concurrent teaching, which you know they've been doing all year long. And I think, you know, as a teacher myself, I know how difficult that can be, and how much you would, uh, how much I would look forward to just having to deal with one of those scenarios. But uh, in the, at this point, they've been doing it since September and they've gotten pretty good at it at this point. So I think that we would have to you know, ask them to continue to do that. Um, I, I wouldn't see a scenario where we'd be moving out uh, remote students from their classroom into a fully remote. Um, and it also, of course, has the flip side, of course, is that if some of these remote students uh, want to now go full time in person, do we take them out of the remote classrooms? And again, ideally, I think 
the best scenario is to keep them with the teachers, but I would ultimately, I guess, leave it up to the parents what they want. Um, so, or at least value their input. That's just my take right now. Brad? Yeah, just to pick up on that, Matt, that's the same question I had. I think the it'll probably be easier, and maybe I'm wrong, to figure out the hybrid students who want to come back um, five, five days. The, the students who've been remote who want to come back in person, and according to my notes, and Beth, I may have gotten this wrong, but it's five in the first grade, seven in second, seven in third, seven in fourth, and 10 in fifth. Um, Miss Kane and Miss Temple, my understanding is there's two remote classes per grade from one through five. So, you know, we can't even assume these, that these, are, these will be the final numbers. It's five, it could be four, it could be six. But let's say these numbers are, are representative and assume that they're, they're split among the two teachers, that's gonna be really tough if you have two people in person and 17 on a screen. Um, I think that will be the, the biggest challenge for us trying to figure out how to, to honor. And as Justin said, in this 31 pages, people, there is just, they're filled with praise for, for teachers and their relationships they formed. Um, the remote to in-person, um, the limit, I think, will be one of the toughest ones for us to handle logistically. And I'm, go, I'm going to hear from parents and, and principals and teachers about that. If, if I could just add a piece, um, Brad, I completely agree with you. I think just bringing hybrid students back to school five days a week is an easy challenge. And, and we could manage that pretty quickly. It's the remote. And I think... Um, and certainly, I, I don't, I'm not saying that in that we don't want to accommodate remote families who want their child to come back in person. I don't mean that at all. It's just a larger challenge. Um, and, I, and in fairness to the survey and the families who filled out the survey, it was not clear on the survey that if they were choosing to be, if they were currently remote and choosing to be in person, it was not clear on the survey that there was potential to not be able to get your same teacher. Um, and so on the registration form, we want to be very clear. Are you, you I, if there's a choice, I'm currently remote, I wanna come to school in person, I am willing to have a different teacher or I am not willing to have another teacher. So that's, that's the differentiation there that we will need um, to make clear decisions at the end of next week. Yeah, and one of the things I've heard, or we've all heard um, throughout the course of all of this, is just how darn good those remote teachers have been. And part of it's because their their teaching model has been always the same. They have the challenge of teaching it through a computer screen, but they're they're teaching only through a computer screen. To do that with two kids, even if two, three, four kids are in the room, one, I'm not sure those kids will be getting the full in person experience that the family may want. Two, it's just it's just it dilutes the the effectiveness of the remote model that these teachers have established. And balancing the effectiveness of that model with the, the relationships these students have formed, I don't know if that's, I don't know to what degree we can accommodate all the parent needs, but certainly something we have to think about. Um, and if I could just add, I appreciate you saying that, um, you know, I think when people hear on the news about remote learning and the remote learning is not successful and we have to get kids back to school, um, it's not, um, I think that in general, remote learning is not, um, talking specifically to the remote classrooms that we have. Um, I think all six remote learning teachers um, that I have at Russell Street would tell you that they have had made wonderful progress with their students, amazing progress. In fact, um, um, I heard from Kat Dale today about this, just the amazing progress that her students have made um, this year. Um, and even, I, you know, she indicated it's on par, if not better than it, than classes that were in person. So I really do want to be sensitive to the needs of those families who selected that model. Um, and really the, many of those students have thrived in that model. So I think that's important for us to consider as well. Justin. Um, sure. So I got a couple things to talk about, many of which are some of the things we've already discussed. And I think we're all kind of on the same page with what, what the recommendation should be. And, but um, we touched on the date a little bit. It was kind of mentioned as, you know, April 5th, April 5th. And I just wanted, I'm sure everyone's aware, but it's the language is that they encourage, um, encourage school districts to bring back students as quickly as possible. And I would add, as safely as possible. Um, 
And one of the other things that we didn't touch on that I've seen a lot of people talk about is, well, it's, <laughs> well, the guidance now said that we can go down to three feet student to student. The guidance is still six feet staff to staff and six feet student to staff. I believe that that's correct unless somebody um, knows otherwise. So we haven't really, we're not, we're not really changing a whole lot. And as um, when the caller, Wendy, when she called in, it's, you know, we're going from six feet to, to five feet. And as the principals have already shared, it's not that hard to bring the hybrid students full time. So my recommendation, my ask would be to, to start as soon as you're ready. Um, you know, there are some things to think through like lunch and I believe we have uh, tents ready um, at our disposal that the snow, we had a great day today. The snow probably melted. Um, we can get the tents up. Um, and the idea of half the kids in the classroom eating and half the kids in the cafeteria eating, there, there are things that need to be worked through. But let's not forget that we were asked by Commissioner Riley to put a plan in place at the beginning of the school year, which seems silly. Like, why would we have a full day plan? Um, but I'm glad we have it now because we can sort of dust it off, check things out, um, run through the safety protocols again, and, and sort of move as quickly as we are comfortable with. But I would ask you to please not start a day later than you need to. Um, in terms of the remote families, I, you know, that is sort of the sticky issue here, K to five. Um, they, they clearly want to keep their teachers. Those teachers did an outstanding job. And I, my guess is that when we, when we ask them to fill out new enrollment forms, if they, well, they might, some of them might want to switch to a different type of instruction. I, I think some of them are going to revert back to wanting to keep the teacher and finish out the year. So I really don't think it's going to be as big of a problem um, as we're possibly discussing. And there might be a couple of people that say, yeah, you know what, my child really needs to get back in or to the in-person learning for the social emotional stuff. And the only reason we chose remote was because we needed a five day consistency and that family might be willing to make a switch. So what I would suggest is that we like two weeks ago, I asked for a survey, right? Just let's get the new enrollment forms out ASAP. Let's work really hard. Um, and let's, I would love to have a discussion around a start date because I, I believe that, we don't have enough to figure out um, where we're going to need to, we're going to need April 5th. I think we can certainly start March 29th um, for K to five and the middle school, of course, you know, there's, it's a little bit more complicated for you, Jason, but um, you should, obviously you are starting to think about it now. So you've got that extra time and, you know, they're giving, they're saying March 28th, which is, a Wednesday, interestingly enough. Um, I think it's because it's, I'm sorry, April 28th. Uh, I think it's like, cause it's two days after the break and they just don't want to bring everybody back the Monday after the break or something like that. So if they're thinking that someone can start on a Wednesday, K to five can start as soon as we're ready. It doesn't have to be a Monday. Um, other things to talk about as we get into this, um, is probably a check-in with some families about their child's social emotional needs. I mean, th these are topics that we don't have to go through tonight, but uh, it's happening in my family firsthand. It's happening in many, many families. Like when the kids come back five days a week, what's their stamina going to be like? If they need to switch learning modes, how, how are they going to feel safety wise, all that stuff. So it's really, really, really important that we um, start, you know, checking some of these boxes as we get into this. Um, I guess I would kind of like to hear from some of the other school committee members or possibly some of the other members of the administration as to what they feel is a, a reasonable start date is how much work do we really have to do to try to do better than the mandated date? Uh, I mean, we, we, we are proud of our town. We're proud of our district. We're, we think that the staff and the teachers have done a terrific job. And this is our, there's a lot of work left to do, but this is an opportunity to show the community that, you know, we've been asked this for a while um let's get back before the last day this is a perfect opportunity then for for me to chime in a bit uh justin we did have that conversation uh it, it lasted a long time and and uh 
it, it was spirited in a good way. Uh, after listening to the K-5 administrators and, and considering what they need to do to make this work, I want to make sure that, that when we pick a date that we're going to be successful. I have no interest in picking a date and, and we're not going to be ready or we're going to have to band-aid things. So having said that, uh, I know we had talked about March 29th when I started the meeting. That, that was my goal. Uh, at the end of the meeting, uh, I softened, in, in, for good reasons, the, the uh, concerns that the principals and assistant principals raised had great merit. And as a result, I'm, I'm recommending as a superintendent that uh, K-5 start April 5th. I've had conversations with uh, Principal Everhart as well, and uh, we both feel very comfortable that, that we could actually have a middle school launch as well on April 5th. All right. Anybody, Matt? Yeah, no, I would. I, that's awesome about the middle school. If you guys can have the middle school back uh, five day in person for the remote learners by April 5th. Yeah, I'm the dad with, of two middle school learners. Exactly, right? <laughs> um, <laughs> but you know, I, I'm with Justin as far as, you know, if you can do it, uh, March 29th, March 22nd, I'd be at this point. We're going to do it. Um, I think do it when you're ready, but I, I'm going to defer to the administration. And if you're telling me April 5th is the best day to start, then, you know, I'll support you in that. Uh, you know, but I would, if, if you can do it sooner, that'd be great. Um, you know, I think a lot of people are anxious to get back to the five day uh, in person and have some sense of normalcy. You know, I know my kids, I would have no problem sending them five days a week. Uh, at this point, but, you know, I'm going to defer to Kelly and the administration. If they think that they need that time, then I think that's valuable. And in all fairness, maybe we should hear from uh, Principal Kane and, and Principal Temple just to, to give their thoughts as well. Sure. Um, so I would love to do the 29th. I would love it. I'm just very cautious of what the, the, the Google Forms were gonna look like when we come back. As Principal Temple said, if it was just our hybrid students, I think we could handle this, it would be a quick turnaround. The unknown right now is the remote coming back and, and I want them back, we all want them back. And that's the part that I'm, I'm concerned with saying March 29th and then that form really warrants many other discussions that we're gonna to have to have as a leadership team on what is this gonna look like? Are we bringing the remote teachers back? Is it half of the class? Is it only two kids? So I don't wanna rush these decisions and and just to bring the kids back because this is about the kids and it's thinking methodically about the best way to do this for them so when they come back they're comfortable they're in a loving and caring environment they have everything that they need that's my only apprehension is just what the google form results will look like and the time we need to truly plan it out to have a good um welcome back for the kids um we Certainly for Russell Street, we'll have plans in place before Thursday. As I said, we were working on measuring and doing things today. So we're not waiting until Thursday to put our plans together, obviously. And I don't think Shaker Lane is either. Um, but again, as soon as we have the, um, the data on Thursday, the registration form isn't due until Thursday night. night. And so our hope is to have 100% of those forms back so we can, you know, spend a day crunching those numbers and really looking at if it's not a lot of movement, then it's an, it's an easier transition. If it's a lot of movement, then it's a more difficult transition. And so that's really what, what we're looking at. If it's hybrid kids coming back to school, we got that. That's not an issue. Um, and so, you know, it, it really depends on, on the, the significance of the changes. Um, but certainly what we have, you know, we've already started our planning and we'll have it in place. It's just a matter of how much we're going to have to do after we crunch the numbers. Can I ask a question? Has there any con consideration been given to, and I, I'm not recommending, I'm just asking if consideration has been given to the, the feasibility of uh, opening earlier for the, the hybrid kids that are just going to stay and go full time and then phasing in the uh, any remote learners that want to come into the building 
you know, several days after or a week after if that's if that time is needed to do that. Um, and I'm not even asking you guys to really, and I actually would prefer that you didn't answer that right now because I'm obviously putting you on the spot, unless you have thought about it. If you haven't thought about it, I would ask you to say, we have not thought about that. We will go back and think about it. And, you know, maybe what we could ask as a school committee is that you think about that and think about what we've asked is to, you know, give yourselves another week to really think about it uh, and and report back to us next week when we are meeting again already scheduled to see if we've made any progress on possibly starting on the 29th, either in whole or, or in part. And then, you know, we can make a decision about whether or not we think that's going to be doable. If it's not, then we just fall back to the fifth. Okay. Mike, can I just, do you mind if I just jump in to follow that? Yep. I, you took the words out of my mouth. Um, so, we've heard that it would be pretty easy to transition hybrid back to full time. Um, I think, a, you know, a significant amount of the hybrid population has wanted this for a while now. Um, all, all the studies have come out and the, you know, those that are okay with it should, should be able to move forward. I also have a ton of friends that are remote families and they're, you know, it's their significant piece of the puzzle here and we need to make sure that we're not leaving them behind. Um, that's not anyone's intention. It's, they're just as important. Those classrooms have been wildly successful. Um, but I think the DESE guideline actually says that if there's a change in instructional model, you have up to you know two weeks to notify the family. So that kind of goes in line with, hey, the remote thing's a little trickier. We got to figure out if those families want to actually transition to in-person. And if they do, How's that going to work? Are they going to have to change teachers or are we going to allow them to stay with the same teacher? And if we do, how much does that disrupt the learning model in that classroom? Because my, my guess is that K to five, those classrooms are pretty tight. And I think you're probably going to have the parents say, hey, um, if you want to go to in-person, you know, the best thing to do is probably to um, maybe change teachers. I don't know. I'm not, but I, my guess is you're going to see sort of a pact to say, hey, let's finish the year together. We've got such a strong community. Let's stay where we're at. And, you know, if we could if we could start with the fully in person a week or a week and a half earlier, because we don't really have that much to worry about, that's meaningful. I mean, every single day we get is huge at this point in time. Um, so, I, Mike, I agree with you. I think it's something to consider. I think we need to get a little creative here and think outside the box and we don't all have to move at the, you know, whatever it's going to take to to do the best job. Uh, this is a huge decision. Uh, it impacts everybody and we just need to do the best job we can. Thank you. Yeah. Mike, there's a reason you are the chair. I think that that's a great <laughs> idea. Uh, and I, was, it, I, it, I didn't think of it myself, but uh, certainly, you know, if we can think outside the box and get some kids in there earlier. And like I said, if we can, again, I will defer to the administration, but uh, if they can look at that and, you know, we can keep the, get the hybrid kids in any earlier, that would be awesome. Brad? Yeah, I knew there had to be a reason Mike's the chair, and I guess we, we've discovered it now. Um, I want to uh, thank um, Michelle Kane, I think, who was the one talking about, they're just things I don't think about. I don't think about how classroom furniture is stacked in containers and whether you can get to those containers because of snow and ice. Um, but these are the logistics that's really helpful for y'all to um, surface for us. I like, you know, on the surface, what, what Mike and, and Justin and Matt have suggested makes sense to me. Um, and I, I'd love to, to have y'all think about it some and see if it makes sense when you, um, when you scrutinize it from your perspectives. Um, what I'm hearing though, is that it sounds like we might possibly um, need until April 5th, but it also seems to be just as likely that we can move forward earlier. You know, um, Cheryl, you're saying when we have the data on Thursday, we'll, ha we'll know more, we'll know more. Um, I would be more comfortable, but I'm also cognizant of the fact that families, we've heard a lot this year about how families need, need information, they need to be able to plan, they need, you know, to figure out coverage and all kinds of transfers and all this kind of stuff. I would be more comfortable not Keeping the fifth as, I mean, it's, it's the legal, you have to by this date, date. 
but still trying to do earlier if we can. And if that's a staged or tiered um, approach, then that, that, then that makes sense to me as well. But if I don't want to say April 5th, and if the data comes in on Thursday and your leadership team's going to look around and say, yeah, we can actually do this earlier, but we said the fifth, we've told people the fifth, they're planning for the fifth. So now we can't move earlier. I would hate that to be the result. Um, so I would, that's just my thoughts there. Timo. So I have to agree. Um, if we can get them in earlier, it'd be great. The hybrid kids earlier, that would be great. And I did, Michelle brought up something about which hit me was the social emotional thing. We've all been speaking about that over the past year, the social emotional effect and to make sure that these younger kids have those classrooms ready and stuff. If the administration feels we need the time till April 5th, fine, but I would like to see them back in because the community has been asking for it. Um, my other question is, and I think it's great because I have a middle schooler too, um, but getting back in earlier, um, the high school, we haven't spoken about it all. Um, I know there are families. I know that there wasn't a date put on by Desi. Um, and I know that John, you're probably working on things too. Is there, I don't want to put you on the spot and say, is there a date there, but are we moving towards anything for the high school, even though there wasn't a date put in place? Kelly, do you want, do you want me to answer that? Uh, well, if, if you feel comfortable, I don't want to put you on the spot. The, the no, focus of today's it. meeting was, was K-5 and 6-8, but if you feel comfortable, that's yeah, fine. I can certainly uh, share our initial discussions. At this point, the superintendent and I, actually, we, we met today for lunch and talked about this and uh, just sort of mused about different dates. And it seems like quite sensible that the, day, the Monday uh, after April break would be the day we could launch at the high school. Um, you know, we, we one of the things we're trying to be cognizant of is our custodial crew and really prioritizing the elementary uh, shift and moves for the classroom. We thought we could maybe capitalize on having the April break to for Keith and I to be in there with the custodians moving furniture, ranging rooms, that kind of thing. Um, you know, the, the challenge with that perhaps is the teachers aren't there, but we're just setting up furniture at that point. There's not there's, it's a different classroom dynamic and setup that Michelle spoke to at the elementary level, the types of spaces they create there. Um, it certainly would be in close communication with our faculty uh, about prior to the vacation about what their preferences are for, for arranging the rooms and having it all sketched out. Uh, but we feel we could take that, you know, that's completely doable and we want to open the gates as soon as possible and let them all in. And so, uh, but we know that we'll also, and you and I think I, I was talking to someone from PTA, that there are a lot of seniors who are going to, when they're into their college, they're going to continue to be remote um, if they're, if it works for them. Uh, and we're going to actually put some more, um, you know, we, we want to make sure that the students who are, now attending five days in person aren't just pulling a switch on a given day. They've gotten accustomed. We've been very flexible in understanding about saying, you know, you know, if they need a day to stay home, they go remote. Once you're committed to the in-person model, it's, you know, it's like school was pre-pandemic. You're expected to be in school. And if you need to stay home because you're symptomatic or you're close contact, or you're quarantining, we get all that. Of course we want that. We'll follow that. But it's going to be like school was before. Uh, we, that's part of the transition process as we prepare for September. We want to start getting students accustomed to how we do things, how we used to do things, and how we'll do things in September. So the earlier, the better for us uh, when it comes, you know, to April. Uh, if we can move that date based on the progress that's made in, in other places, uh, we certainly would be open to that. But I want to also have dialogue with the faculty about that. I have not done that. Uh, so I want to get their feelings on it. And see what, but we certainly feel that April 26th uh, is, at least from my judgment, Keith and me, and, and Kelly seems it feels it's sensible too. Okay, I appreciate that. I um I didn't mean to put you on the spot or anything. I just know that there are probably a lot of parents on here stating, you know, and wondering about it. So, but um I would, you know, fall back like Matt said to the administration and Kelly and what you feel is best for your schools. You know your schools best, you know your staff best. 
what they need to get the kids back into a comfortable and they're comfortable. Um, I agree with. Thanks, John. All right. Anybody else at the moment? Uh, Chairman Fontenelle, if no, yep. no other school committee wants to speak right now. I, I, I don't think we, we have finished the conversation about remote learners. I think we've had a partial conversation and, and I think we need to, to give that conversation a little more time and merit. This is probably the, the hardest decision that, that we have to make in terms of bringing, bringing kids back. Uh, the administrative team and, and, and I have been pondering this, this component for, for days and, and weeks really. And there's one side of the discussion that says, it makes sense to keep students with the same teacher. But there's another side of the discussion that we haven't even talked about tonight. And that is we have remote programs that are developed. They're going well. And some parents are, are concerned about keeping the integrity of that program. So that has merit as well. This is not going to be an easy decision. And then we may have a scenario where we have potentially two students in a remote class that want to come back full time. So is it fair to that teacher and the other kids in that class to have that teacher start live streaming as well? So this is not going to be an easy decision to make. And, and I think it's gonna to have to be situational in some cases. I don't believe that, that we're gonna have continuity by any means, it would be nice if we do. But I think this is the hardest decision that, that we're faced with making as we, as we uh, integrate uh, to full, full time return and still run a, a parallel remote program. I'd also like to, to speak a little more to, to what John has said. Uh, rightly so, we, we've created a, a series of models that, that promote flexibility. And that was important. That was paramount to the success of what we were doing this year. But now we're, we're going to be bringing back structure, middle school and high school and our elementary schools. And, and if our students are, are going five day full in person, then we need to get back to the time where if you're not at school, uh, we, we, we need to have a good reason why you're not there. If you're symptomatic, uh, if you're close contact, but we, we, we can't have kids, and this is more of a, a challenge in, in the uh, middle school and high school. We can't have kids uh, or students, more correctly, just deciding that, uh, you know, I want, to pay, I want to stay in my pajamas today, so I'm just going gonna, gonna to work from home. Right now, that's fine. But the minute we go back to full in person, that isn't fine anymore. And I know it's going to take some time. And, and uh, Jason and, and John and I have had these discussions, and, and even... Cheryl and, and, and uh, Michelle, but, you know, and we're, and we're cognizant of that, but we really need to, to start thinking about what next September is gonna look like. And, and from the indications that we've had from the Commissioner of Education, it will be full return, one model business as is, with the exception of mitigation factors that, that will still be in place. So I'd just like to, to hear some, some comments from, from you as a school committee, if, if you share the, the uh, challenge of making these decisions with, uh, with remote or, or do you think it's more clear cut than, than we do as an administrative team? I'm gonna lead out on that one. I, I appreciate what you're saying. Um, and I, I think we've alluded to it and I appreciate the fact, Kelly, that you, you said, you know what, illusion is not enough. We've gotta be more specific. Um, because I, I made a note that to, to talk about what is the remote to in-person going to look like? Because that's the concern I have is that looking at the numbers from the survey, there was indication that a number, a really smallish number of fully remote learners indicated in the responses that they would contemplate coming back to in-person. And we talked about, well, what is, you know, do we really understand the context of that? And we talked about it, did the respondents understood the context of that? But now we have to ask ourselves, do we understand the context of what that answer means? Because I'm not sure that I'm comfortable with what has been a fully remote classroom all of a sudden having, say, two to five in-person learners 
in 15 to 17 remote learners. But I would also assume that that's not what those par parents are envisioning either. I know we've talked about, you know, they really want to stay with their teacher. Well, in that instance, if you really wanted to stay with that teacher, that means with the teacher, with the mode, in my mind. And if you, if you really think your child is going to benefit from coming back in person five days a week, then you're probably going to have to give some strong consideration to foregoing that continuity if we can't accommodate that student into a different classroom, an in-person classroom with a different teacher. Um, I think we need to make sure that that is probably the expectation. It might not be wholly borne out in every instance, but I think that needs to be the expectation for people. I would assume, I'm assuming to a strong degree that that is the expectation, that those families have already figured this out for themselves, that if they're going to come back in, it's not going to be with the same teacher because that's not what that classroom was designed to be. And they're okay with that. They, they, they're going to trade that off for what they perceive as the, the benefit of being back in person five days a week. But that's, and, and I appreciate what Cheryl said, like, we need to see it, right? The, the survey is the survey. You project out and it's predictive, but you know, not wholly predictive. Well, you know, the, the, the enrollment form or registration form, whatever you want to call it, that's not going to be predictive. That's going to be the real thing. And it's incumbent upon families to understand the sooner we have that information, everybody that's clamoring for this change, the sooner we have that, the easier it is for us to get through the process and shorten that time frame and get it done. Um, so that's where I'm with that, thinking about how to, how to handle that particular transition. You know, I, I think about like the hybrid to remote, you know, I'm assuming that all of the in-person classrooms will still have a flavor of hybrid learning because there will be absenteeism for various legitimate absenteeism related to COVID. So we're not going to get wholly out of the business. We're not just not going to be able to of providing remote instruction in those hybrid classrooms. It's just going to be a lot less. But that seems to me like that's less intrusive to have a couple of remote learners every day or, or some days because we've already had remote learners every day in those hybrid classrooms. So that's not as big a deal to me. Um, I think that's more manageable. It's not ideal, but the whole year is not ideal. So it's going to be less intrusive in some ways because it's not going to be 50-50. Uh, but I, again, I think that we can manage that. I think it's going to be much more difficult to manage a couple of in-person learners or a, or a small percentage of in-person learners, small ratio of in-person learners to remote learners and what has been a fully remote classroom up to this point. So that's where I'm at. Brad? Yeah. You know, I was, I'm looking at the numbers as I, as I wrote them down and, if I'm counting these right, based on the survey, which isn't a commitment, it's not a registration, um, there, there were nine families from grades one through five, I didn't write down K, I'm sorry, um, looking to go from, or nine children, students going from in-person to remote, and 36 going from remote to in-person. That's potentially, now some of these will be from the same family, that's potentially 45 families are going to be affected. If what I'd like to hear from the principals is because we have to, like, if we're sending this registration form out, we need to make expectations super clear. Um, and so is it safe to assume as Mike just did that if I'm one of these nine students who's currently doing hybrid is going to full remote that I can stay in my same classroom and just participate through the computer. Cheryl, does that seem, is that, is that a safe assumption um, for us to move forward with? Just to repeat what you said, if you are currently hybrid and you want to go remote, it's safe at a safe assumption you can stay with your teacher. Yes. yes. Okay. okay. And, and Ms. Kane, do you agree with that? Does that seem workable or right? Or I think it's just the current model that we're in. Yeah. Okay. So it is. Yeah. We're currently okay. doing that. Well, then, so then the question is what do you do with the, these 36 ish, right? Um, students. And there's, frankly, there's probably a workload issue here. That we have to think about um, because if the remote teachers are losing five, seven, seven, ten students, that means the in-person teachers are not only teaching this, they're having essentially like two kids per classroom come in as if they're coming in from out of district. Um, and 
So now you need two more seats or things like that. So there's, there's a workload issue here too, right? Um, now, so that may be a separate conversation, but if we're putting out a registration form tomorrow, Monday, whenever it's going out, how are we going to word that so that the parents know what they're signing up for? Um, about yeah. it. is that a decision we have to make right now? Uh, we we do, and and Beth, you can you can maybe chime in. I mean, we we have designed a couple of questions to address that, uh, but it, it's not going to be as black and white as we'd all like it. I mean, we we do need to know that our parents more correctly need to know that there, there is a chance that if, if you want to go from uh, remote to hybrid or remote to full in person more correctly, you, you may have to, to go into another classroom, but you're, you're right, Brad, the, the, I don't like to use the word equity issue, but the disparity between class size is a concern. I mean, uh, all of you know that, that in the LEA contract, they uh, have a clause in there that uh, the disparity should be no greater than four, four students. Well, based on the math, that's going to be tough to handle. If some of these classes, I mean, and if I'm, maybe I'm wrong, um, but if some of these classes are losing two to three students and the other classes are adding one to two to three, um, there's your four right there, assuming they start with the same baseline. Mm -hmm. and the only the only thing we could, I mean, we don't know how it's going to work out at this point in time, but that might be a conversation that we need to have with the LEA in, in terms of remote classes or perhaps a different classification than than full in person. I mean, there there are ways to to have conversations to, around this. Beth, did you have uh, some input on, on how this uh, might look when it goes out the door? Yes, yeah, so we um, have been in conversation with the K-8 principals um, with regards to this. And not long before the meeting, I was actually on the phone uh, with Cheryl. Um, so in, in you know wording of this, because it is tricky, we want to make sure we're explicitly clear. So that way, because when we do this in registration form, we're taking this as this is your choice. This is what we are going to plan for your child. Um, and so um, what we're looking at is giving a question, if you're a hybrid, giving the question specifically to you. So if you're a current hybrid student, um, you're going to have the, you know, potentially, depending on wording, three options on the form of, um, you know, I'm, I'm registering my child for five full days of in-person learning. Um, or I'm registering my child for five full days of remote learning only if we can keep the current teacher um, or another one of registering for five full days of remote learning, even if we have to change the teacher. So making those explicitly clear as to whether they're going to accept that change of teacher or not. Can I make one suggestion on that one? Can, can we add a fourth option that would say, I'm choosing to go full remote and I would prefer to be put in a full remote classroom for, yeah. for K through five or, or mm -hmm. one through five, right? Because we, we could conceivably grant that accommodation and it may help smooth out, you know, it's not going to fix it because I think it's, I don't think you're going to see as many of those changes, but at least by, based on the survey data, but I think that would help. And, and they may want that, right? That, that may be, they may be saying, please, because we've heard all these things about the remote classroom. You know, that's what we, we're going to go for that. It would be interesting to see what that response is. Yeah, it's a great suggestion. Thank you for saying it. I'll, I made note of it. Thank you. Just a quick point of clarification. We do have a remote kindergarten classroom, don't we? Oh, do we? Okay. Yeah. So you would need okay. to include kindergarten because oh, that, uh, yeah. that was the Desi that. mandate. Okay. Thank you. And Beth, do you can you give us an idea what what the questions are going to be, how they're going to be framed for the current remote students? Yes. So for current remote, um, we're looking at very similar structure. Um, so I'm registering my child for full, five full days of remote learning or I'm registering my child for five full days of in-person learning only if we can keep um, this, the current teacher 
And then the third option, I'm registering my child for five full days of in-person learning, even if we have to change teachers. So then I'm going to ask, they might want a fourth question too. I'm registering my child for in-person learning. If I can get him into a full in-person classroom, and the way we're trying to convey this is as, al as the alternative being in a remote classroom with only a couple of other in-person learners. Like, would that change your mind? If you knew you could only be in the classroom and there was only going to be three other in-person learners in there, you might say, oh, forget it. I'll stay remote. Or if, because I can't, if I can't get into that full in-person classroom, I'll just stay remote. Michelle? So that's when I talked earlier, I think that's when it's going to warrant, like Cheryl said, looking at these. And I think right. Dr. Clenchy said, looking at them at case by case and say, all right, right we have seven kids in grade one. Let's reach out to those families and explain to them the situation that they still want to go with that. I think that's that layered question that we're going to have to ask once we get the data back. Yeah, I appreciate it. But I think it might be worthwhile to have it on there so they know that it could conceivably be an option. Like, obviously, I think the 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 message that we're trying to convey here or alluding to is there are no guarantees, right? We just can't guarantee anything until we have all the data, then we'll be able to make some firmer, I don't want to say promises, but we'll be able to tell you exactly what you're going to get yourself into based on the choice you're making. Could I say that there possibly should be a guarantee for the students that are currently in the hybrid model? Yeah, 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 yeah. I'm, I'm sorry. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That that's reasonable. And I, you know, I appreciate you best sharing this. We're not going to hold you to it, right? If you guys, because you're the pros from Dover, if you guys, you're going to make your own decisions about what the right wording is. You know, we're giving you input, but you guys ultimately we will defer to you guys to get this done correctly because this is what you do. Mike, are we yeah. comfortable offering? If I heard Beth correctly offering fully remote students the option of being in person with their remote teacher. Um, because we were talking earlier for a variety of reasons why, why the remote model seems to be working. Um, and I, I just don't know if that's a workable model um, that's going to set the teachers or the students in, in person or even the remote students up for success. If there are two or three kids in a classroom with a teacher who's used to teaching fully remotely, and that was the strength of that model, is that she um, could focus on the remote model. I just, I don't know if, if we want to put it as an option, that's fine. Well, that, that's kind of what I'm, I'm saying is that all of these are options. I think we can, we can convey with a strong degree of confidence, like almost a hundred percent that if you're a, in a hybrid classroom and you want to come in five days a week, you're staying with that teacher. We don't see anticipate any problems, but the, the other ones are going to be the, the people have to be ready to understand that we're not going to necessarily be able to do it the way you want, because there might be considerations that while we understand what, what we're asking of you is significant, we think it's appropriate because the benefit to the other students or the, and or the staff is so compelling that we have to ask for it or, or even require it to a degree. And Cheryl? It's going to have to be situational. Yeah, exactly. And I just wanted to add the other factor that we haven't talked about. There were a few families in the survey that said that they were currently in person and that if the, mm -hmm. if the social distancing changed, they would choose to go fully remote. Um, and that was only three or four, I think three um, at Russell Street of the um, responses that we got. So the other thing to consider is if we have three students currently in person that want to go remote and we have three remote students who want to come in person, those could change. Right. If, and if that's we're all, if we're all amenable to that. Right. Correct. Right. So that would still require a teacher change, but yeah. it's, still, it's yeah. still a model we didn't talk about. Yeah. I, I think it's important to understand the questions are not in, in getting them the questions asked and the responses back is the first step in the process. And for several, probably not a lot, but for several families or whatever percentage, there will be significant follow up to make sure you guys are working it out and they understand what they're getting. And they're going to have the, the opportunity to reevaluate their initial decision based on what 
once we're able to convey to them exactly what that might mean to them. So, which we right, almost always do, right? That That's the goal. And that's going to be key in the timing. Michelle and I had a long conversation about this. If this, if we are in a situation where we are making phone calls on, you know, mm -hmm. Monday of the following week, that could be days of that week trying mm -hmm. to reach families to have these individual discussions. And so I just think people have to be a bit sensitive to the amount of time that individual connection is going to make in it at once we've crunched the numbers to then go revisit families on the phone and have these conversations about the reality of the situation and right. if they still want to do it or they want to change. Right. And I will say, again, this is the benefit of being Littleton, right? This can be done. We can handle this on a case-by-case -case basis because of our size. Um, and, and, and that's something we should, we've should. we always taken advantage of, and we need to continue to take advantage of that opportunity. Justin? Yeah, you make a um, good point, Mike. We're a small town. Is it, do we, can we just get... Um, forms back from those that want to make a change and if you don't form, send your form in your default option is you just if you're hybrid you go full-time and if you're remote you stay where you are and then additionally can beth can you just add a question that says i would need to be contacted about my change because my guess is that only like 15 percent of our students are actually making a change the, so the those problem, are the only people you really need to talk to the problem is though then you have to set a deadline right like like and it has to be a reasonable deadline because if you do it that way and you set the deadline for three days and somebody doesn't respond and then you assume that means something and then you tell them that and they'll go, wait a minute. Well, I didn't even know there was a, I didn't even, I didn't even get that email. What do I do? Well, well, I, da, da, da. That's probably going to happen anyway. So talk that through. So what's going to happen? Yeah. They, they're in their remote classroom and they stay there and then they reach out afterwards and say, wait a second, I wanted to make a change or they still think we're doing a B and they stay home and they try to log on. We'll just, Hey, you can come to school now. Like, um, Justin, one of the important parts of the question is um, we didn't talk about a follow up question on the bottom is regarding buses. And I'm not sure how to get around that because some parents have been driving their child and may not want to drive their child anymore if they're coming five days. And so that's I'm not quite sure how to get around that. Beth and I talked about that right before the meeting. Um, that's the last question on the survey is, will you require a bus? And that's a, another whole piece that has to be um, put into place. Obviously, kids who are taking the bus can continue to take the bus. But um, part of that question is, you know, if you, you know, if a family was driving their child twice a week, and now they can't do that anymore, um, because of the five days a week, will they require a bus? Um, so that's another kind of big chunk that has to get answered and looked over. The, the administrative team combined has have been collecting information for well over 100 years. And, and I can say with confidence that in a survey like this, or not a survey, a form like this, you don't want to make any assumptions. You, you, want, you want to give every family an opportunity to respond. And that's just experience thinking. Are speaking. We we really need to know where people stand, and we can't make assumptions in, in this situation. It it, uh, it, it is it, it's just too prone to flaws in, in the process, and, and so I wouldn't feel comfortable doing it that way. I know we we do do it on occasion when we have field trips, but that's a whole different go up ball game than what we're we're talking about tonight. So. And it does make it sound old when I make that statement. <laughs> <laughs> right. Out of those hundred years, you've got most of them. Steve, Steve Mark, you want to comment? Yeah, I, I just want to mention, um, you know, we're working, we're trying to work through the, the bus issues. We have posted so people can go read it. We have posted the new DESE guidelines on transportation. Uh, and just so people understand, um, the, the, the distance requirements are relaxed when we put students on buses. So um, we could, we're, we are now, according to the regulations, allowed to have uh, two students in a seat before it was one seat. It was one student per seat, and they, we had to zigzag those, those students. Uh, the regulations now allow for uh, two students per seat, so you're less than that three-foot distance. Now, they still have to wear masks. We have the windows open and things like that. But the parents need to understand that, that if they put their students on the bus, they may be sitting next to another student on the same seat, that's less than a three foot distance. I just want to explain that so the public can can understand that. 
and they can go out and read the regulations. It's on our website. You can read the DESE guidelines. Thank you. Yep, good point. Thank you, Steve. There, there's one thing we, we still need to discuss this evening uh, on this section of the agenda. Uh, I had sent some information to you today regarding kindergarten. Uh, I had an email from the kindergarten team and you've read my response. Uh, we really need some direction uh, before we can even begin to plan at Shaker Lane because it, it involves moving around staff for specials, et cetera. So I would like some guidance in that area in, in terms of is it an expectation that, that kindergarten is, is, is part of the process? I know it's in the requirements uh, that they will be offered five full days as we move forward. We just need that clarification from you this evening if that's, if that's the line of thinking that you have. All right. What do you guys think about that, school committee members? Brett? I, I read the letter the team sent to you and I, I read your response. Um, I think we as a town have emphasized the importance of, of full day kindergarten. We've some, um, and we, we think it's important. I think this year more than any year, probably it's important to give um, those kids as much time in school um, and access to teachers and each other. I would support um, following the commissioner's um, directive and um, an offering, not requiring, offering uh, the, the, the five day full day. And I do that, I completely understand the teacher's kind of concerns and wishes, um, but I, 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 I think it's, it's important. Yeah, I just wanna clarify that there would be the option for families that wanted to remain in the half day model, it would be a five day model. Uh, unless they wanted to go full remote, um, but they could uh, remain in the, in the five day, half day. So it'd be a, a, a family's choice about how they wanted to go. go. All right, anybody else about Timlin? Um, I know that it was mentioned, Michelle had mentioned earlier that um, the kindergarten staff had been helping in the afternoons. And I know it was mentioned in the letter. Um, are you, not that I'm not in support of doing five day, full days for the kindergarten, but Michelle, do you feel that you'll be able to cover what these, the staff has been covering in the afternoon for the other grades? Um, are we, I know that substitutes have been hard. I'm just, I'm just wondering what your thoughts are on um, how, if we do do, if we do do five days full day for kindergarten, is your, how are we going to work out the logistics of the rest of the school where they had been helping out? You know, that's, that's a great question. And again, it comes down to the kids that are coming back. So if these students are returning, our reading specialists, math specialists who have been pulled in two different directions, teaching remote, teaching in person, if those kids are coming back, then that might free up some kids to group them together because now they're here. Um, so that's one layer of looking at it. Um, you know, I, I do think that we, you know, it was an additional support. It was great support. The teachers will have the kids more full time. I, I do think they'll be happier to have them there. Maybe they can do more targeted instruction because they're all there. So can we do it? Yes, we, we can do it. And it will be a change, but it's just going to be a matter of looking at how can we shift the current supports that we have to maximize um, additional support that they may need in the afternoon. Mm -hmm. um, Justin or Matt, thoughts about full day kindergarten? Sure. Um, you know, Kelly, Michelle, you guys kind of hit on it. I think, I think you understand, you know, quite well the needs of the students and also the capability of the staff. So, um, you know, this year more than ever, I think maybe you know those kids are going to go into first grade next year, and. Um, I think it's important to try to give them as much exposure to in-person learning as those families are willing to take. I, I really do. And, um, and you know, the capabilities of the staff and I trust that you guys are going to make the right decision. So I'll leave it there. Mm -hmm. yeah. I would say the same thing. If we can get them in more, 
it's only going to benefit them. So uh, I will again defer to administration what they can do and uh, so they can work some magic. Yeah, I concur with that. Um, Brad, go ahead. Well, I just so, and I'm sorry, I maybe I should know this. There's a full, there's a remote kindergarten class now, right? Would that one be all, two? Okay, good. And those could potentially become full day as well. If yeah, that, that makes sense. Okay. Yeah. All right. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah, I appreciate that. I think that uh, it's important, like Kelly said, that you know we we support full day kindergarten. We have for a long time. We're driving towards tuition free full day kindergarten because of, of how much support the community has asked us to give it. Uh, so I think it's important that those families that are asking for it be afforded it. Um, they, they're the ones who know their kids best. And, and if they think it's appropriate for those kids to be in, even in the, in the circumstances, then I think we should support that. So um, I think that addresses that. I, and I, before, I think we're getting to a close here and, and we will open it up for, for public input. But I just want to reiterate, I, I think the big part, the big takeaway for me and I want to make sure the school committee agrees and the administration hears the direction is that in regards to the, when we would be able to, to go to this model that, you know, we would ask you to consider over the next week, the opportunity to get at least, you know, the, the kids that are the easiest to get in there. And I use easiest as a very relative statement. It's not going to be easy. It's just going to be less hard uh, if there's an opportunity to do that, then we would ask you to, to think about that over the next week and let us know next Thursday what you really think about that. If you've been able to come to any firm de firmer determination, uh, appreciate the fact that the information that we're going to get from the registration is going to be so important. We would ask the families really comply with, with their responses on that. But if, if that's my takeaway is that we're asking you not to be firm on April, be firm on April 5th is the absolute last day, but give us one more week of effort to and report back to us next week. If you think there might be a way to, to get in a little earlier with at least some of the students, if not all that, that am I understanding that correctly from the other school committee members? All right. And Dr. Clenchy, if you got, if you can just take that direction and, and, and give it another week and see what we come back with. Sounds good. All right. Thank you. Anything else before we open up for public input? All right. Thank you. All right. Let's go ahead, Dorothy. Okay. Brad Lang, please state your name, your street, and your question, please. Brad My name is, okay. yep. My name is Brad Lang, uh, 76 New State Road. And my question is, I missed the first hour of the meeting. I don't know if you guys went over it, but um, Tiger's Den. Um, we spoke to Martha over at Tiger's Den, and she wasn't unclear on what was going to happen due to some of her staff having to find other work. Um, will Tiger's Den be open for morning drop-offs and um, if kids need to do after school uh, when, when they go back full-time? Thank you, Brad. We actually have not addressed Tiger's Den at all tonight. Um, Dr. Clenchy, any any updates or thoughts there, on Tiger's Den? To my knowledge, there, there should be no changes in terms of what, what we would currently do with, if uh, we have five full days of students at school. So currently we offer the after school program right now. Uh, we have to, we'll have to look at the before school drop off and, and, and look at staffing levels and see if we can't accommodate that. All right. okay. I think it's important that we uh, f uh, roll that up in with all the other planning we're doing and, and, and try to get some, uh, keep, keep that current so that we can, as we meet and, and, and get this information out to the public, that becomes part of it um, without Brad having to ask again. <laughs> okay, Brad? Great. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Danica Johnson, please state your name, your street, and your question, please. Danica, you're muted. Hi, can you hear me now? Yes. Okay, my name is Danica Johnson. I live on 28 Lawrence Street. So my question is, can we make a different consideration for hybrid students than we are for the students that are fully remote? So the students, um, I know they, there absolutely should be a significant amount of planning that goes into preparing for these families who 
opted to be remote to this point in the year. Um, and I think that taking the time to do that is really important. However, the last survey that you sent out, you asked for all of this data from hybrid families. We responded, some students are already in the classes. So the cohorts are already mixed at this point. And both Michelle and Cheryl said that they can handle the hybrid students in the school. So I feel it, it's hard to argue that these online students have such a strong community because I believe that the hybrid students do as well. And the students in this model who haven't been allowed back in four days are really feeling disconnected from their community. So I think it would benefit them to get in as soon as possible and be able to spend some time with their teachers and the rest of their classmates. All right, thank you, Danica. Yeah, we agree. Um, that's why the school committee is asking the administration to try to accelerate that timeline. Uh, but there is definitely uh, things that need to be done logistically that go beyond the planning for the transition conceivably of, of some learners from one mode to the other. We talked about, you know, furniture movement, getting the classroom set up. So I think that uh, the idea that we would try for the 29th as the earliest date, I think conforms with the, the requirements that the administration is communicating to us that, that they need to get the physical part of it done. And then there's the educational aspect of it, which we're hoping we can get, you know, uh, if that takes a little bit longer, we'll still get some students in prior while that the, the, that, that last cohort is straightened out uh, through, through a process. Okay. T. Sawasik, please state your name, your street and your question, please. Terry, hi, thank you. Yes, thank you. Hi, Terry Sawasik, uh, Ernie's Drive. Um, I'm a longtime Littleton resident and a second grade teacher, currently um, a hybrid teacher. Um, I would like to thank everyone for the very thoughtful discourse this evening. I think a lot of people have brought up a lot of good points. Um, I just wanted to mention a little bit. Um, at one point, there was a family member that said, uh, a that, oh, it's only six inches difference. That is um, maybe true in my current numbers. This discussion of where whether or not remote students will move to a hybrid class or are now a full class greatly can change those numbers. Um, by the way, at 5.5 feet um, in my classroom to get everybody in, it means I lose my teacher table which means no reading groups. So the numbers are only one portion of the factor. I think that's an important thing that the public needs to recognize. Um, I cannot wait to have my entire class with me, but it does mean um, a lot of thought. I'm so thankful to uh, Dr. Clenchy for saying we need April 5th. There are a lot of different logistics that are quite complex. Um, I'm happy to bring in students as soon as we can, but if we need to bring in additional students into a classroom, it's not just uh, one more desk, it's literally finding where to put everything. And it could be as little as four feet, depending on the numbers. So uh, that's my, I guess my last point. Um, thank you. All right, thank you. Yeah, I, I, your, your point is entirely, both your points that I heard were entirely valid. Uh, those distances could change. The uh, DESE guidance is three to six feet, but, but the guidance they gave and the guidance from the CDC is to not reflexively go to the minimum, it's to push to keep it as, 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 as high as you can get it and still get the kids that want to be there in there. We appreciate the comment you made about uh, losing the ability to use the classroom as effectively as you guys have shown. You can use it when you don't have to deal with these things. Um, we realize that you guys have made sacrifices in that regard. We think it's it's been done for the right reasons, but we, we acknowledge that this is not ideal and we appreciate 
everything you guys do to, to minimize the negative impact given the, the challenges you're facing. So thank you. Tasha Clark, please state your name, your street and your question, please. Hi, my name is Tasha Clark at Tunashoba Trail. Um, I currently have three remote kids. And so my concern is that if um, people are seeing these numbers, so the five, five and a half feet, they're gonna be more comfortable with moving their kids possibly from remote to hybrid. So what is the possibility um, what are the options that are going to happen if there's say um, there's two current hybrid there's two current remote full classes so when you only have say 35 or 30 students who still want to stay remote what what are the possibilities that could occur there yeah um I think rather than try to, we, we talked around that a little bit. I, I know and I'm, I'm sensing that we haven't been specific enough. I, the, I think the reason we haven't been specific enough is that what the actual numbers are, are going to dictate what the options are. And oh, rather than, <laughs> than, than try to come up with answers that might be moot once we get the data, I think we want to give the, the administration the opportunity to get the data, use it, and come up with the best scenarios. So I, I know you can't, I, the numbers are going to be very critical, but when we fill out this survey and I, or other families say that we want to keep our kids remote, but then half the kids in the class want to leave. So that leaves a teacher kind of in limbo. Yeah. Are our options still going to be open at that point and not locked in? Because then people may... If their teacher is now in person, that may switch. They may want to send their kid in person, which again, changes all the numbers for other things too. Or that, I mean, even if we have to change the teacher to the other remote, like that's going to, the right. remote parents are left in a big limbo after we've already right. kind of made our choice. Right. I appreciate that. I would say that the idea that half of the remote learners are going to come in as in-person learners is not going to be borne out. The survey data did not indicate that at all. It was a significantly lower percentage of people that based on the response. Now, again, the response was 1,100 or 1,600, so you have to project a little bit. But I will say that we, we've gotten some emails to this uh, on this same theme prior this week, and our response as a school committee was, we appreciate the value that the current remote, full remote classrooms are being regarded by the families that are in them. And we have told the administration that our expectation is that we are going, you guys are going to minimize the impact on those classrooms as much as possible. Um, the goal would be to, to really not see any change, uh, maybe except for different faces or, or a couple of less faces, but we really understand the value that you, that the remote families have in this. And we appreciate what the staff has done with that delivery of, of curriculum. So we're trying to make sure that everybody understands that we're going to try to keep do everything we can to keep it whole in the way it is. I really appreciate that because the teachers we have are absolutely amazing. And like we've made so much progress and I get emails at like midnight and 5 a.m. from the same teacher. So I know how much time they've put into making their classes completely virtual. So for them to, to have to switch to a different mode, I can imagine is a huge. Right. Um, we're, we're not envisioning those remote class, those teachers or those remote classrooms being asked to change out, except in the most extreme that circumstance that we don't think is really going to happen. We okay. would be shocked. All right. Thank you. Yeah, no, thank you. Thank you, Tasha. Right. Mike, can I chime in there? Yeah. Um, you know, listen to Ms. Swasik's comments, um, thinking back to um, kind of Kelly's chart from earlier and thinking about, what people said and what we know, like Mike, you and I, when we were, we were in classrooms measuring things, we were thinking about teaching space and stuff. I think we need to be honest and say that if you're sending your kids back into school, there's a chance the distance will be closer to three feet than six feet. Um, and we're going to try to maximize as much as possible. But by the time you add in, you know, if we're talking 20, 21 students in these classrooms, 18, 19, 20, 21 students, a teacher, an aide and a reading specialist. Um, they, um, we, the notion that it's going to be five and a half feet just seems um, absolute best case, maybe even pie in the sky um, to me. If we're thinking about like the space that teachers need to move around, right. um, it's, it's not just math. Ms. Swask remind us of that. And I just think, and that, that's within the guidelines. So that's what the, right. the, 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 um, the commissioner told us we, we can and should do. 
But I think we just need to be honest with people. Yeah. About that. I mean, I appreciate that, Brad, but I'll be honest. We already have the teacher in there. We already have the aide in there. We already have the reading specialist in there. And it's not going to go from six feet to five and a half feet to three feet. It might go to four feet, but we're, we're talking about adding in the, the in, in, but I will say you're, it will depend on how many remote learners trying to come in that we have to account because we're not talking about six classrooms available to them. We're talking about four out of six. So I appreciate the point you're making. I don't know that it's going to collapse down to three feet and it's certainly not going to go less than three feet because we, we even the commissioner saying isn't advocating for that or requiring that. So that's fair. I think, but, I, but I think it would be worthwhile to, again, once we have the numbers, update that chart we saw, we'll see it. Yeah. And, I, I, and I think maybe three feet is, maybe we don't need to, to say that, but I think if people take away the five and a half feet, um, yeah. I'm, afraid that, I'm afraid we're not going to be able to do that. Yeah. I, I would, I would argue that you're correct in that, that it, it, it depending on how many uh, remote learners transition to the full in person, that number is probably going to be closer to between four and five feet than between five and six. And we, we really need to, and I, and I know we've, we've had a great dialogue this evening, but there was a, a point in the dialogue where three to six feet was mentioned. And, and that is the, the protocol where we're going to do the best that we can, but I don't want anybody to think that, that we're not following those protocols. We are, we're hoping to do better than that. But uh, bottom line is it's three to six feet. We feel we can do better but we've talked for an hour and a half about all the variables that, that come into to play when we're, we're trying to figure this out. So, and an updated chart is a, is a great idea when this is all said and done. Yeah. Okay. All right. I think we're good there and we do believe it or not, we got a few more things to get through. So let's see if we can do it. Uh, the next is contract proposals for the educational assistance and administrative assistance. Dr. Clenchy. Thank you. We had an executive uh, session last meeting and, and went through the proposals. Uh, quick, quick synopsis. Uh, the uh, educational assistant contract, one year contract, uh, it covers the current year, 2020, 2021, 2% uh, increase. The uh, administrative uh, assistant contract, uh, Again, covers 2020, 2021 year, 2% 2 increase. The only difference in, in, in the proposal that, that was made to you uh, is that we added a new grid and, and created a category titled executive assistance. And those are the uh, assistance, executive assistance report directly to the principal. So they're the, they're the uh, principal's uh, uh, support. So uh, again, 2% and, and uh, I really, I really think it's pretty simple settlement. I, I don't, it's not complex at all. So at this time, I, I would like to ask for a, a formal vote to uh, accept those proposals as presented. So moved. Right. So moved. Second. Second. All right. Motion made and seconded. And is there any other further discussion on this or any questions for Dr. Clenchy? All right. Seeing none, I'll call for a roll call vote. Timlin. Timlin Rouse, yes, yes. Matt. Matt Hunt, yes. Brad? Brad Austin, yes. Justin? Justin McCarthy, yes. And Mike Fontella votes yes as well. Thank you, Dr. Clinchy, for taking care of that. Uh, one more opportunity for input from interested citizens. All right. I think we're good there. Thank you, for everyone, for coming out tonight. Uh, subcommittee reports. PNBC? Nothing to report. Okay. Uh, budget. Stay tuned next week for the presentation. We're gonna have the budget presentation next right. week. It's gonna be awesome. It's gonna be huge. All right. Uh, it'll be different than the one for the last fourteen years. <laughs> I'll be presenting. So yeah. I think you should get those third graders. They can do it and do it in slow motion animation. That actually, I may actually uh, email Heidi McGregor tomorrow and see if she can get them on that. <laughs> Uh, yes, that is our public budget hearing. Uh, so that that is an important meeting. We will be ready for next week. Thank you, guys. Uh, policy subcommittee. Um, yep, we have three policies that are ready for first reading. Um, they were attached to the agenda, attached in our 
packet. So ICICA, which is the school year calendar, school year and school calendar. We had um, an addition on that. Then ID, which is the school day. We had an addition on that. And IGA would stand as written. Um, okay. So they should all be in the packet right at the very end, page 60, 58 <laughs> to 60. <laughs> you find so, policy amusing, Timlin? Do you find uh, policy amusing? It's fun. I love policy. <laughs> Does anybody have any questions or input on the first reading of these three policies? Seeing none, I will ask for a motion on the first reading. Should I make that motion? <laughs> this is new to me still. You can. And it's getting late. Um, I make a motion to accept the three policies, IC, ICA, and ID with the change, the additions, and right. IGA as written. All right. As a first reading? Yes, as a first reading. Okay. Second. Motion made a second. Any further discussion on that? Seeing none, I'll go roll call. Timlin? Timlin Rossius, yes. Matt? Matt Hunt, yes. Brad? Brad Austin, yes. Justin? Justin McCarthy, yes. And Mike Fontella votes yes as well. Brad, CPAC or anything? Yeah. Um, so um, Lynn can give us maybe a little bit of an update. We've been part of our state visitation team was in talking to us about um, about our, our programs and the way CPAC is functioning. I know they interviewed uh, me as a school committee member and also some other parents. And I think we're in the team, in the, the offices, um, kind of auditing files and, and checking it out. It was, it was a good process. Um, and Lynn, I'll ask you to say something about that in a second, maybe. But also, there's going to be CPAC elections coming up for officers and school liaisons. Again, we encourage everybody to get involved. Um, if you have um, just an interest, you don't even have to have a child on a 504 I or IEP. Those elections will be April 13th. Um, Lynn, is there anything else we need to know about the visit? Um, sure. There is a document that's going to be going out about the CPAC elections. The principals will be sending it out in their newsletters on Friday. It's um, already posted on the LPS PPS department um, CPAC page. Uh, as far as the TFM review, um, it was a very thorough and very wonderful um, process. And um, we had some really nice feedback. Um, Dr. Uh, Clenchy and I had our um, exit interview today to review the initial findings. We'll be receiving the report. Um, uh, the initial um, feedback, we'll be receiving the report in up to 60 days, uh, within 60 days. Um, they did share with us the uh, parent survey results, which was nice. They definitely commended us for the number of parent responses that we had in the district. We had 59 parents respond, which is actually a, a pretty big number, uh, especially for a district of our size. Um, as far as just the, the responses, 80 8% of the respondents um, felt that the um, felt welcomed, felt that the schools welcomed all families. 95% felt that they were included as a member of the IEP team. 86% felt that their input is valued. 74% felt that the eval process um, adequately assesses their, their child in all areas. 74% of the respondents felt their child is showing progress towards schools. And 86% felt that the academic supports are provided in a way that supports um, their child's uh, special educational needs. Um, so that was really positive and great to hear. There's definitely more work for us to do and plenty of areas where we can improve, but um, overall it was a really wonderful um, process. So two things for that, if you don't mind. Um, one is um, those reports, the, the documents, the evaluation documents that we get in 60 days, those will be public at some point, right? They are, yes, they're all posted on the DESE website. Um, you can actually peruse all of the districts across the Commonwealth um, who are in this um, stage of the TFM process reports. The second thing is that those numbers are really good. Um, they really are. Here and um, what I've known about CPACs and, and satisfactions with this process, those are really good objectively. And during a pandemic year when everything is in flux, um, I hope the teams are proud of that. Um, hope you are and hope everybody else is working on it. That's, that's good work. 
All right. Great. Thank you, guys. All right. I think we made it to the end. All right. Anything else? I make a motion to adjourn. All right. Second. Motion made and seconded. I'll take a, we do not need an executive session tonight. This will be the end of the meeting. Uh, I'll take a roll call vote. Timlin? Timlin Rossius, yes. Matt? Matt Hunt, yes. Brad? Brad Austin wishes Matt a happy birthday and votes yes. <laughs> Justin? Justin McCarthy votes yes. Happy birthday, Matt. Yeah. I hope it was extra special. Mike Fondella votes yes as well. Thank you, LCTV, Judy and Dave, and Bettina and Dorothy. And we'll see everybody next week for the public budget hearing and an update on uh, our plans. Thank you. Good night, everyone.